Hi, everyone. Welcome to the NASIO um, workshop on the future of carbon capture, utilization, and storage. I'll just wait uh, one more minute or half a minute until people are trickling in. So while people are trickling in, welcome to the second day of the NASIO workshop on the future of carbon capture, utilization, and storage, technology and policy considerations. Um, yesterday, we had a really great discussion about um, technology and, and what CCUS technology looks like. And so we're really excited to continue that today um, with an outlook on policy considerations, what is happening, um, what can states do, what's the federal landscape look like. Um, and before we do that, I'm just going to go over a few housekeeping items and then we'll kick it off. So you're all very familiar with Zoom these days, but just as a reminder, this is a webinar um, format. If you have any questions, please type them uh, into the chat box or in the Q&A box, um, and we'll be able to um, use them and, and um, ask our panelists your great questions. Yesterday was already a lively discussion, so we're hoping to continue that today. You can also raise your hands and we can unmute you if you'd like to pose the question live, so to speak. Um, if you have any technical questions, um, questions or problems, please message Shimika Spencer in the chat, or you can email her also at spencer at nazio.org with any tech concerns. And I would be remiss to not thank my colleagues, Kelsey Jones, Rodney Sobin, and Shimika Spencer for the excellent help and preparation um, of this workshop. And I also want to thank again the Office of Fossil Energy and Carbon Management at the UE who's supporting our work on CCUS. So today, as I mentioned, we'll look at the policy considerations for CCUS. We're really excited to kick this off with a half hour fireside chat. Um, and then we have a panel looking at um, CCUS and the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, um, specifically what kind of opportunities for states are. Um, then we'll have a panel on states' perspective um, on the CCUS policy landscape, what is happening in the states, what are some challenges, some successes. Um, and then the final panel after a break, um, engaging communities on CCUS, what are some workforce development and economic support consideration. And then we will have about 45 minutes at the end of today to really have a lively discussion, hopefully with all of you on policy considerations for states. Um, you've heard two days worth of technology and policy and thoughts. And so we would like to hear from you what is going on in your states. What do you think the next steps are? What are some of the challenges and how maybe um, NASIO or the Department of Energy can support some of your work? So without further ado, I want to introduce our prior site chat speaker, Dr. Julio Friedman is the senior research scholar at the Center on Global Energy Policy at the School of International and Public Affairs at Columbia University. He served recently as the principal deputy assistant secretary for the Office of Fossil Energy at the Department of Energy, where he was responsible for DOE's R&D program and advanced fossil energy systems, carbon capture and storage, CO2 utilization and clean coal deployment. His expertise include large-scale carbon management, CO2 removal, hydrogen production and use, and CO2 recycling, oil and gas production, and international clean energy management. He's also had positions at LBNL, um, and he's the CEO, CEO of Carbon Wrangler, um, an advisor to Carbon Direct, and distinguished associate at the Energy Futures Initiative. Um, so really excited to have you here, Dr. Friedman, and Dr. Friedman will look, um, give a short talk about kind of the state and federal policies on CCUS um, and a general outlook on CCUS policy development in the past decade and in the future. So we're really excited. I think he's actually sitting in front of a real life fireplace, which is rare. So thank you for joining us and I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. Uh, and thank you to Nazio for having me. Uh, I'm a huge fan of Nazio and its members and what you guys do. So it's a pleasure to be here today. Yes, indeed, that is a fireplace. And yes, indeed, uh, there has been a lot of good news around carbon capture and storage over the past 15 years. Um, the primarily, this has come in the form of, you know, policies that allow people to get paid. Until about three years ago, everyone recognized that carbon capture was something you could do. There were demonstration projects. We ran a bunch of them in the Department of Energy, and it all went very, very well. But Ultimately, you couldn't get private investment because you couldn't finance projects, so you couldn't get paid. Um, that is no longer the case. Uh, there are two policies now, one at the state level and one at the federal level that do that. One of those is 45Q, which I'm sure you've heard a lot about. 
The other is the low carbon fuel standard in California, which in September of 2018 amended its low carbon fuel standard with the CCS protocol, which allowed you a way to get paid. It is also the case that technology has improved quite a lot over the past 20 years. The costs have come down. There's now many companies that will provide you a unit with a performance guarantee and a wrapper that makes it a whole lot easier to think about these things. And the regulatory framework has matured quite a lot. This includes, among other things, uh, the Class 6 well standard by the uh, EPA, which is designed for the injection and storage of CO2. We are seeing, of course, uh, today, and I mean literally today, uh, we are seeing the birth of this industry uh, in real terms. We will see whether or not the reconciliation bill and the infrastructure bill are passed. If they are, they have substantial amendments to existing law and, ex and substantial new laws that make it possible to get paid. In the context of 45Q, one of the most important of these is a direct pay option. Direct pay means you do not need to go to a tax equity attorney to get the job done. You don't need to have a billion dollars in tax liabilities. You can just get a direct check from the treasury uh, under, I think, section 1266. Uh, but it is also the case that they are looking not just at doing direct pay, but also increasing the quality and value of the payment. Right now, a saline aquifer project uh, would allow you to receive $50 of tax crediting per ton, uh, the bills currently have $85 uh, as the proposed increase. We will see if those are legislated, but if they are, $85 is a whole lot more than $50. It means it is a lot easier to get financing for power projects, for industry projects, for hydrogen projects, for all kinds of things. Speaking of hydrogen, we're looking at the new production tax credits under 45X. Those would provide somewhere between uh, 75 cents and $3 a kilogram of hydrogen as an incentive for clean hydrogen. If you are clean enough, you can get paid through a carbon capture and storage mechanism, either with what's called blue hydrogen from steam methane reforming or autothermal reforming with carbon capture, or with biomass hydrogen with carbon capture and storage. And in fact, uh, those are probably the ones that will end up receiving the highest tax credit, assuming that those are enacted. Uh, by that, I'm talking about, you know, uh, uh, doing uh, sub the, get, reach, reaching the very highest bracket of what's possible. Uh, it's easy to think about these things just in terms of the tax credits. If you did, you'd be missing out. Uh, first of all, on the federal level, we're also looking at other kinds of infrastructure support. A few noteworthy ones, the SCALE Act, which would provide debt financing for pipelines. That would be awesome. That would go a long way. Another thing that's being put out there, uh, site characterization money. This is in the form of a plus up to the Department of Energy's Carbon Safe Program, SAFE, run by the Office of Fossil Energy. And the Carbon Safe Program basically gives individual grants up to $50 million to do site characterization and assessment for CO2 storage. That is something that many companies will not undertake on their own. The costs are too high, the risks are too high. This is really, really interesting. In many cases, it's worth knowing that the Department of Energy seeks a modest cost share for these things, between 20 and 50%. That is a good role for states. It is possible to think about state agencies providing that cost share or helping make matches between companies and the DOE in a way that facilitates cost share. So, excellent things to do. There are also in the infrastructure bill, $8 billion of hydrogen hubs. Those are designed as color blind, blue or green or bio. It is also the case that there's three and a half billion dollars for direct air capture hubs, $17 billion for port upgrades, $25 billion for airport upgrades. There's money out there to do an awful lot of this stuff. I don't wanna give you the impression that the states have been idle, quite the opposite. Nine states have passed clean electricity standards whether or not CES qualify, sorry, CCS qualifies within a clean electricity standard is actually within the purview of the states. And uh, if they accepted that, then in point of fact, it would allow rate recovery through the utilities, which would allow the financing of projects. 
that is absolutely within the purview of public utilities commissions, public service boards, uh, the Secretary of State for Western States, uh, Secretary of Energy, I'm sorry, within Western States, et cetera. Uh, we have seen a large number of states besides California enact low carbon fuel standards, notably Oregon and Washington. We are expecting that Illinois, Colorado, possibly Minnesota, possibly New York, possibly New Jersey will enact clean fuel standards of various kinds as well. It is noteworthy that Canada has already enacted a clean fuel standard and that has passed a Supreme Court challenge. That is another way to get paid. So if you are a border state like say Montana or North Dakota, this may be of interest to you. You may have something interesting to think about with our Northern counterparts. A few other quick thoughts here on getting paid. Uh, the clean uh, electricity payment plan, the CEPP, I do not know if that will make it into law or not, but if it does, it is a payment plan. It's a way to get paid. And in point of fact, what qualifies within that will very much end up in the jurisdiction of states and in state representatives. Uh, last but not least, uh, in order for all of this to succeed, we really need partnerships. We need partnerships across sectors between the power sector and the oil and gas sector and the industrial sector. We need partnerships with communities and municipalities. We need to find ways to give voice and agency to those groups that have questions and concerns at the same time as we want to support workers who are looking for good jobs. All of these things will require partnership. One of the interesting things is unlike just throwing a solar panel up on an existing transmission line, carbon capture use and storage projects are fundamentally cooperative in nature. They require a collaborative framework to get the job done. I could spend another five hours talking through this stuff, but rather than do that, I'd rather have some time to talk to Kirsten and perhaps to address some of your questions and concerns. Yes, thank you. This has been a really, a really great overview um, of what is going on um, uh, and on the federal and on the state side. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about um, kind of the local carbon fuel standard that you mentioned in California and some mm -hmm. of the other states that um, are thinking about that and where you see some of the kind of challenges um, and potential benefits are and what kind of consideration states should, should um, undertake when they look at that and potentially the role of, of CCS. Absolutely. So the low carbon fuel standard is pretty straightforward. It said that by 2020, the entire fuel mix of California must decrease its total carbon footprint by 10%. And by 2030, the total fuel mix must decrease its carbon content by 20%. One of the advantages of that, it means that high cost items actually get spread over a pretty wide rate base. So what this turns into functionally is a $200 a ton CO2 credit what that actually ends up looking like is about 20 cents per gallon. Um, it is not a fuel tax. It is simply what it costs to be clean. And the market is equilibrated at that level. So that's what we're talking about, 20 cents a gallon. In some jurisdictions, that's a big thing. In the state of California, in the state of New York, not so much. Um, by creating a pathway for carbon capture and storage to have access to that program, it's created a whole set of opportunities uh, that are, are quite broad. Some of those are inside the state. So for example, we're making ethanol in California, doing carbon capture and reducing its carbon footprint there. But it also has allowed you to think about making low carbon hydrogen as a blend stock for the refiners or as a fuel directly. It has allowed you to think about doing carbon capture on a dedicated power plant project and using that plant to run electric cars. It has allowed you to do capture on a biodiesel facility and reduce its footprint that way. So it becomes a very versatile tool and you just set the rules and let people do what they wanna do. Um, in terms of the problems the state has been coming across, there's a couple of things that come up. One of them is most of the, many states that are most proactive on the fuel uh, intensity uh, have issues with carbon capture. They, the public, perception of it remains problematic, and there remain deeply committed groups that are opposed. Um, that's the nature of the work. Uh, and states like California and Colorado were working through that. How do you engage the public in a constructive way and still get to yes? Uh, it is also the case that the state has discovered 
that it has questions about whether or not it should take primacy with respect to running the class six operation. A number of states have already done that, notably North Dakota and Wyoming. Louisiana has filed for primacy, Texas probably will. The question then is, should California, is that good for the state to do or not? They are wrestling with these questions themselves. Finally, and this is something that was raised in the chat function here just now, is access to the poor volume. Uh, the way that states deal with subsurface poor volume is quite varied. Um, one of them, in some states, it's considered a water resource. In some states, it's not. That's a pretty big difference. In some states, there is a lot of control over the offshore poor volume, like in Texas. Uh, in other states, like in California, that's prohibited. <laughs> uh, in some states, there is a unitization clause, which allows you to basically uh, opt in landowners if enough other landowners agree. In other states, that is completely impossible. Uh, in some states, the state actually owns a certain amount of poor volume through the water board or through some other function. In other states, it doesn't. So access to CO2 storage resource is in fact a huge deal and lives almost entirely within the states. And in Western states, particularly which own a lot of the land, this is an opportunity. Thank you. That's been really that's been really interesting. And yes, we're seeing so many uh, different issues. And yesterday we heard um, from um, one of the um, electricity co-ops um, looking at or working on a project Tundra, which I'm sure you're familiar with. Um, and they were talking about, you know, the issue that that they're not uh, a tax credit isn't isn't so so helpful because they're you know not paying taxes. Um, so you mentioned the 45Q direct payment option, and I was wondering if you could expand a lot on that a little bit and, and see and, and explain if that is also then applicable to, um, you know, electric co-ops and others that might not be able to, to take advantage of the tax credit at, per se, and what other options there might be for them. Sure. So there's a lot of opportunities for electric co-ops. One of them we've already mentioned, which is direct pay. The direct pay option actually would allow a taxpayer like Tundra to be considered as already paying its taxes and get direct payment for the tax credit. So they do not need a tax appetite to collect the tax credit. This was discovered originally around solar and wind developers. Many of them were similarly small and did not have a tax appetite. So there was a direct pay option provision that was provided during the ARRA amendments that allowed them to get paid directly. The 45Q is being, again, it has a proposed amendment to do that exactly. There are, of course, granting programs. In addition to the one I mentioned, Carbon Safe, the DOE has granting programs for front end engineering design studies. Those things can be as much as 30 or $40 million a pop. And of course, demonstration projects. So at some point, there will be an opportunity for Project Tundra to qualify for demonstration projects that are being considered in the reconciliation bill. Uh, and that would be a plus up to the Department of Energy where they could be paid. The Department of Energy also has the Loan Program Office. Uh, and it is possible to get low cost uh, debt through that program, uh, essentially really long tenor debt, which is very good. And last but not least, of course, the Department of Agriculture also has uh, uh, rural power programs. And there are special provisions written into both the loan program office, the DOE, and the USDA programs for rural power developers. So there are ways to get paid through those mechanisms. Um, and I would encourage you all to dive into that because the money's real uh, and it's backed uh, by the sovereign wealth of the United States. Great, yeah, that's been really helpful. Um, and um, if there's interest from the NASIO membership, we certainly are also happy to provide some more information on that. Um, we have a question in the chat to also maybe speak more about the SCALE Act and debt financing for pipelines, because um, that might be something that not everybody on the call is familiar with. Sure. Uh, the SCALE Act was actually first proposed uh, some three or four years ago, uh, and it's nice to see it incorporated in the current round of legislation. In, specifically, it's in the infrastructure bill, and what it does is it gives the Department of Transportation special authorities to make loans, and to make loans, again, with preferred debt terms to people who want to buy CO2 pipelines. So as one example of this, uh, there's a project that's been announced by Valero and BlackRock to capture a whole bunch of CO2 from a bunch of ethanol plants 
and to move it all to Illinois. And they're building a dedicated 1200 mile pipeline to do exactly that. That is exactly the kind of project where if they wanted to, they could go to the scale act and say, hey, we'd like to get you know, uh, the low to cost debt from this. But it's not through the loan program office, it's actually through the Department of Transportation. That has a couple of benefits. One of them is the DOE programs require you to show something novel. Uh, the Department of Transportation program does not. Another is again, the eligibility threshold is lower for the Department of Transportation. So it is easier to engage these people. I would say, of course, if it's enacted, oh, today, then in point of fact, uh, it will still be a while before the DOT is quite ready to accept comers. They will have to set up an office and hire a staff and stuff like this. This gets me, by the way, to an important point that everybody on this call should be thinking about. There are simply not enough human beings in this field. We are severely limited in human capital. Two thoughts about that. First of all, state offices that have been working this are already a source of human capital for this. You guys are already international class experts and you don't even know it. So this is something you should get into for real and you can help the federal government, you can help companies in that way. Second, we need to be thinking about state universities, land grant schools as ways to grow the human capital uh, in your states and regions. And in point of fact, uh, in Wyoming, the School of Energy Resources is one example of such things, but uh, they are by no means alone. University of I mean, Oklahoma University, UC Davis, uh, many others are out there with pretty good programs that help develop the human capital to do this. I believe actually that there is also funding uh, in the federal government to help augment those programs and develop them. Yeah, if I could um, follow up on that um, for a second, because I know that a lot of the state energy offices are um, interested in economic development and workforce development. Um, and, you know, as we're shifting kind of our energy um, from, you know, carbon intensive fossil fuel energy to um, decreased emissions, there's kind of the conversation and question how some of the workforce can be shifted from, you know, oil and natural gas um, industry to, to others such as hydrogen and CCUS. And I was wondering if you could speak a little bit to that where you, you see the potential and benefits and, and challenges there. Yeah, absolutely. Um... So for starters, I know that states have complicated relationships with organized labor. Um, some states are, uh, have good working relationships, others do not. Some are right to work states, some are not. But in point of fact, labor unions are keenly interested in this basket of technologies. Uh, the boiler makers, the steel workers, the AFL-CIO, uh, a lot of the unions see this as their estate and they very much want to see development. So there are pop possibilities for partnerships between uh, states and uh, labor unions on this. It, it is also the case that for states that have a history of energy intensive and emissions intensive work, whether it is in the oil and gas sector or chemicals or steel or other kinds of manufacturing, it is in fact possible to imagine uh, retraining or repurposing existing workforce in these new careers. The easiest examples of this in fact are on the geological storage side, a lot of people who are pipe fitters, a lot of people who are uh, you know, roughnecks on drill rigs, a lot of people who do subsurface characterization of geology or reservoir analysis, like you absolutely need those skills 100%. For people who are in say the chemical business or the steel business, the mechanical engineers and chemical engineers that work in your business have work to do in this space as well. Uh, and of course, that is also true for people who do regulation, for people who get permits, for the land people, I could go on and on. It is very much the same kind of skill set for the la existing labor force. And this is an opportunity to think about uh, augmenting or enhancing or transitioning some, purpose, some portion of the workforce into this new economic opportunity. Great, yes. Um, that is certainly on the minds of our members and, and hopefully there's some of these connections and co coordination and cooperation that can be done. Um, I guess maybe not the quite last question, but one of the questions that came up in the chat was um, if you could maybe elaborate all of the, or some of the federal um, and state provisions supporting the utilization part of CCUS and, and is there some support for rd and investment credits, procurement, what, what does the utilization picture look like? 
Right, so uh, it's important to recognize two fundamental things about utilization. One of them is you cannot get a lot of tons. It's very hard to get abatement in large tonnage through a utilization strategy. Um, to give you an example of this, one of the biggest like CO, one of the biggest sectors for CO2 utilization is cement and concrete. If you have a really big cement or concrete utilization scheme that is using CO2, a really big facility is like 20,000 tons a year. 20,000 tons a year is too small to be eligible for 45Q and is like a couple of days emissions from a power plant. So you can't get a lot of abatement out of this. The other thing that's important to know is many of the technologies are in pretty early stage still. So while I'm personally very enthusiastic about CO2 utilization, most of these industries are, and applications are quite early and quite small. The exception to that, of course, is enhanced oil recovery. Most of the states that are already doing enhanced oil recovery know that well enough that there's nothing useful for me to say here. Um, I will say, though, that in thinking about CO2 utilization broadly in the future, to think about like what you want to do. Here, economic opportunity zones to attract companies, uh, ways to support accelerators and entrepreneurs who want to develop this stuff, like that's pretty good for a state. And a couple of states are basically getting into the business now of supporting such things. I would point, for example, to the state of New York, uh, which has uh, announced a carbon tech accelerator program uh, uh, that they put the RFP out for that a while ago and I expect awards will be made soon. But the idea here is exactly to do that, to support the translation of technology from the bench scale into companies, and then to create a foundation for those companies in the state of New York. Uh, that is an equal opportunity for the other 49 states who wanna do such things. The thing that people like about utilization, of course, is it generates revenues. Uh, and you're making something, as opposed to just cleaning something up. So there's reasons why people like it. You just got to go with your eyes open. Technology is quite early and you're not going to get a lot of tons this way. Yeah. Yeah, certainly. I think that is what people attract to, to utilization. Um, I think maybe the final question, if, if uh, the infrastructure bill does not pass, reconciliation does not include the CEPP, where, where do you see maybe the next kind of hopeful policy development coming from on the federal level? So uh, let's start by saying that, you know, uh, these things are impossible until they're done and then they're suddenly law, right? If we should fail at this iteration, I will personally be despondent. So if we succeed, I'm having a drink tonight. If we fail, I'm having two drinks tonight. Like that's, that's the setup. Like it's one or the other. I'm either having one drink or two. But uh, in point of fact, uh, the people who... It, who like these provisions will wake up the next morning, dust themselves off and say, okay, well, what do we need to do to succeed this time? And they'll try again for next year, next reconciliation bill, two years from now, uh, whatever. Um, I will say that right now, the politics of this are fraught and they don't need to be. Fundamentally, the conversation is shrill and it's dominated by both ends of the dumbbell, but the heavy lifting gets done in the middle. Carbon capture utilization and storage is one of those few things where you can get really broad centrist agreement. There's a wide set of stakeholders who want to see this succeed. Companies and manufacturers, states and regions and municipalities, workers, entrepreneurs, climate hawks, they can actually come together on this. So the, one of the, the last thing I will lead you with here is as state energy officers, get out of your defensive crouch. You got a lot of power, you got a lot of people who like what you wanna do in this space. Don't be scared, don't be shy, you're doing God's work here. You're reducing emissions. You're making a clean and just world. You're creating opportunities for the people in your state. And that's the landscape on which you should think about how to engage. Thank you so much. I really appreciate you leaving us with this positive note. And I really hope that we can drink to the passage tonight or whenever it happens. Yes. I, I will be we'll... actually drinking uh, from the air company vodka. I will be drinking the <laughs> uh, synthetic vodka that's made from carbon dioxide and the primary reason why is because it's delicious it's mm. really really good yes that's one utilization of carbon capture right <laughs> all right thank you so much dr freeman we really appreciate this um and uh you left us with a lot of good thoughts and a great start of this discussion today thank you we really appreciate best. it
And with that, I will turn it over to Dr. Marian Gold. She's a senior advisor at NASIO and she will um, take us to the next panel, which will really dive into the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act and what opportunities um, they're in. So over to you, Marian. Thank you. Can, you. can you hear me, Kirsten? Yeah, great. Wonderful. Well, I really enjoyed that introductory, um, what was it, a lecture or Q&A. There was a, there's uh, kind of very inspirational and a good message for all, all of us. There's so much to learn here, so many opportunities. Um, as Kirsten said, my name is Marion Gold, and I'm delighted to be here today to moderate this session on CCUS in the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act opportunities for states, and hopefully we'll all be having one drink tonight and not two. Um, in August 2021, the Senate passed, as you all know, the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, and the House is scheduled to pass a similar bill um, in September, maybe even today. So in the next 45 minutes, we're going to discuss the implications of the bills for states and state energy offices, with a particular focus on the carbon utilization uh, program, which is a grant program for states, local governments, um, and public utilities or agencies for the procurement of carbon reduction technologies. What could such a grant program look like and how can states best take advantage of the opportunity? I'll start with a brief introduction. As I said, my name again is Marion Gold. I had the pleasure of serving as the commissioner of the Rhode Island Office of Energy Resources uh, for five years. And then I went on to serve as a regulatory commissioner with the Rhode Island Public Utilities Commission for another five years. And now I have a, the pleasure of working again with NASIO as a senior advisor for the electricity programs. Joining us today on our panel are two world leaders in the world of CCUS. And just a note before the introductions, please send questions as they come up um, to us, either in the chat or in the Q&A. Some introductions now. Jesse Stolark is the Public Policy and Member Relations Manager Carbon Capture Coalition, the Great Plains Institute. Jesse Stolak joined the Great Plains Institute in 2019, where she supports the Carbon Capture Coalition, which she's going to tell us about. Based in Washington, DC, Ms. Stolak works with the coalition's diverse membership on a growing national policy and legislative agenda. She's responsible for policy development, coalition member outreach and recruitment, and related communications. After Ms. Stolak speaks, we'll hear from Kip Cunnington, who is the director of the Center for Energy Regulation and Policy Analysis at the School of Energy Resources, University of Rhode Island. A chemical engineer and a lawyer, Mr. Cunnington has more than two decades of experience helping energy companies address some of their most challenging energy, environmental, and climate change issues. So I think we're going to start with Jesse. Uh, she has some slides. And as I said before, send your questions in as they arise and we'll kind of play it by ear whether we answer as we go along or take questions at the end. Okay, take it away, Jesse. Thank you, Marion. Can you hear me okay? Perfect. Yeah. And uh, as an aside, I didn't realize Kip was a, also a chemical engineer. So if this technology has the sign off of uh, Kip as a, a chemi, uh, it's good with me. So um, as Marion said, I am Jesse Solark. I'm the Public Policy Member Relations Manager for the Carbon Capture Coalition. I have the pleasure today to tee up the bipartisan infrastructure bill and discuss a little bit about how it affects carbon management and carbon utilization in particular. Um, but before I do that, I'll just give you a brief overview of the Carbon Capture Coalition and some of our key priorities. Next slide, please. So the Carbon Capture Coalition is a nonpartisan collaboration of more than 80 businesses and organizations building federal policy support for economy-wide deployment of carbon management technologies. And so when I say carbon management, I'm referring to the full suite of carbon capture, removal, transport, utilization, and storage technologies. So our mission at the coalition is to reduce carbon emissions to meet mid-century climate goals, foster domestic energy and industrial production, and support a high wage job space through the adoption of carbon capture technologies. Next slide. So our membership spans a wide array of organizations, including industry, energy and technology companies, energy and industrial labor unions, and conservation, environmental, and energy policy organizations. We really span the gambit of energy sector organizations and political affiliations, which makes our consensus-based approach all the more unique in Washington. We are also deeply bipartisan, which is really a stipulation of the coalition and the way we work. And that really works in our favor 
um, as we're seeing the best chance we have to pass meaningful energy and climate legislation in today's climate is in those areas where there's broad bipartisan support. Um, and that includes carbon management policy priorities that are included in the infrastructure bill. So relevant to this audience, I just wanted to mention that the Carbon Capture Coalition is part of an all hands on deck approach to achieving economy wide deployment of carbon management technology in the United States. So this includes complementary efforts at the state and regional level, which I'll touch on briefly in my presentation later, as well as the industrial innovation initiative, which focuses on reducing emissions in the industrial sector. Next slide, please. So for the uninitiated, uninitiated, and I apologize if this was covered earlier, but we have to go back a few years to provide some context. Um, deployment of carbon management technologies is really predicated on the 2018 updates to the Section 45Q tax credit. 45Q is the foundation for commercial scale deployment of these technologies. <clears throat> and what made passage of the Future Act possible in 2018 was really an unprecedented bipartisan coalition, both within our coalition as well as outside and it really spanned the entire political spectrum and all regions of the, that country and we really believe that bipartisan foundation is what will continue to deliver to success going forward next slide so moving forward from the 2018 updates to the future act or in the future act the coalition is now advocating for a broad portfolio of policies that will enable economy-wide deployment um, for and for carbon management to achieve net, net zero emissions and meet mid-century climate goals. Uh, we look at policy deployment development across these four areas that you see on the screen. And what we'll talk more about today really falls under infrastructure and market development. And the states have a tremendous role to play in market development for these products that can be sourced from waste gases, whether these molecules are CO, of CO2 or carbon oxides or sourced from industry power facilities or directly from the air. Next slide, please. So just a quick little plug, you can learn more about the coalition's agenda for economy-wide deployment by checking out our federal policy blueprint, which is available on our website, carboncapturecoalition.org. Um, next slide, please. So I don't expect you to read all this <laughs> and take it in, and I'm happy to, to share these slides with anybody who, who would like to have them, but switching to the current Congress, we've worked very closely with members on both sides of the aisle to further our collective agenda. Um, at this point, I'm very pleased to say our highest priorities are included in bipartisan legislation that is before the Congress, as well as in elements of the Biden administration's American Jobs Plan, the administration's fiscal year 2022 budget request, and the tax reform proposal. And so this chart kind of just lays out our top priorities. And I'm not going to go through all these priorities today, but they include enhancements to 45Q, particularly to close the cost gap between the value of the tax credit and what we know the cost of project development are, to see greater deployment across industry power and direct air capture applications. Um, I, I caught a few minutes of Julio's presentation at the end, and um, I think like everyone, we are looking at near-term legislative opportunities, whether that's the infrastructure bill or the reconciliation package. Uh, next slide, please. So moving back to the infrastructure package, um, you know, this really represented a coalescing, coalescing around scaling carbon management te technologies at the rate necessary to put us on track to meet mid-century climate goals. So the le this legislation includes two of those significant priorities that are listed in that table on the previous slide. The first is the Storing CO2 and Lowering Emissions Act, or the SCALE Act, um, which is a, a program that would help finance the build-out of regional CO2 transport and storage hubs. It's designed similarly to um, programs that the federal government has used to for um, water infrastructure or other infrastructure needs. Um, it also contains funding for critical um, program authorizations that are contained in the 2020 Energy Act to support commercial scale demonstrations and feed studies for carbon capture. And last, but of course not least, it includes appropriations for the Carbon Utilization Research and Development Program um, that were contained in the 2020 Energy Act authorization, as well as the Carbon Utilization Grant Program. Next slide. So um, there are historic levels of appropriations for carbon management and infrastructure bill, including nearly 1 billion for large scale pilot projects and 2.5 billion for commercial demonstration projects. I saw Mary in the face kind of go, wow, it's a lot of money, um, but we really view this as a, a course correction in terms of if you look at historically, the amount of federal investment um, that has been made in carbon capture and carbon management technologies is actually relatively small. So we kind of see this as a course correction. Um, additionally, the bill provides a author, appropriations for several programs that were authorized in the previously mentioned Energy Act, including the Carbon Utilization Program. Next slide. 
So getting to the utilization program, that's section 40302. Um, this new grant program, again, is housed within the larger carbon utilization R&D program, which received about $310 million over five years. DOE will have broad discretion over how to allocate these funds. Um, but this program would, the grant program would create a new program so that states, local governments, public utilities, or agencies uh, could procure commercial or industrial products that are derived from anthropogenic waste carbon. These products must deliver a significant net reduction in life cycle greenhouse gases as compared to conventional products. Um, so essentially, um, you know, when I imagine what could be done with this program, um, it's sort of a small pilot pro program for, I think, what a lot of people have done by clean, which a number of states are taking up, and we can certainly get more to in the discussion. Next slide, please. So I believe Kip will get more into kind of the state level perspective, but if we look across the country, increasingly states and localities are looking at addressing embodied carbon. These are the emissions that are associated with manufacturing materials and goods. So infrastructure in particular is a huge emitter of CO2, and if states have emissions targets, Looking at the purchasing power that they have to procure lower carbon materials, um, many of which can be sourced from carbon utilization. Not, you know, there's other areas, of course, that you can look at for, for procurement, but carbon utilization is one area. It can be a very powerful um, mechanism to reduce emissions. Um, and we don't have, if you look at steel and cement in particular, they are responsible for a total of 15% of global emissions. And in particular, for those two sectors, we don't have a lot of good alternatives. And at the same time, we are adding a tremendous amount of infrastructure globally. Um, I think the statistic that's just completely eye-opening is we're adding entire New York City's worth of infrastructure to the globe every month. Um, so carbon utilization and carbon capture have a tremendous role to play, particularly in those two sectors. And so this map is taken from the Carbon Leadership Forum. I really recommend checking them out. They're a great resource and they have a tremendous amount of information um, for states that are looking to develop such policies. Next slide. So before we go to KIPP, um, and before I close, I just wanted to mention some of the resources that we have available, both through the Carbon Capture Coalition as well as the Regional Deployment Initiative. We've commissioned some jobs and economic development studies, and we found that across the board, deploying carbon management technologies is a multi-billion dollar investment opportunity that will lead um, to the creation and preservation of good, of good jobs. Next slide, please. And our partners at the Regional Carbon Capture Deployment Initiative drill down to the state level. And if you visit their website, you'll find fact sheets for a number of states. And these are also a tremendous resource at the state level as well. Next slide. So with that, I want to thank Nazio and in particular, Marion and Kelsey for having me here today. And I'll hand over things to Kip. Great, All right, thank you so much. Yeah, Jesse, you Kip, go right ahead and we'll take questions at the end. All right, thank you very much. So, uh, so can you hear me? Okay, I'm assuming people can hear me. Um, yeah, so we can hear you. I'm sorry, I was muted when I said. Oh no, that's fine. Thank you. So <laughs> it's it's a it's a privilege to be here with with Nazio, and and it's a real honor to be on any panel with with Jesse. And I know I'm doing something right whenever I'm on a panel with with Jesse because she single handedly, and her organization, um, they're too modest to, to admit it, but they are devastatingly effective in this space. Um, and a lot of the good things we're, we're seeing going on here um, have, have their involvement. So, um, so it's a privilege to be, to be on the panel here. So I'm Kip, I'm uh, at the School of Energy Resources at the University of Wyoming, and I'm broadcasting live here from downtown Laramie where winter is quickly approaching. We're already down, down in the 30s and have already had a couple, couple nights below freezing. So winter is upon us, but I'm gonna talk a little bit about, so Jesse is definitely the expert on the, on the subject matter of, of that legislation. I'm gonna step back a little bit and talk about why. And then if I may be permitted to use the state of Wyoming as an example for some policies that other states might look at, then I'm going to close, close with that. But, I, but I'm a strong believer that a huge amount of uh, certainly commercial, but certainly on the policy side, innovation um, rests at the state level. 
And so it's it's a privilege to be to be in front of all of you today. So with that, if you could turn to the next slide, please. So I think it's worth reminding everyone um, that that why we're talking about carbon capture and storage and in particular carbon capture utilization and, and storage. And that is because there is really broad technical and bipartisan political support and analytical support for the notion that CCS is a technology that is going to be critically needed to meet Paris Agreement goals. And the, the chart on the left is from the, um, um, actually, I, I said the source there was IEA, I meant EEIA. This is from the Energy Information Administration. Their, their forecast of uh, primary energy sources going out through, through mid-century. And you will obviously see growing penetrations of, of renewable fuels and other non-carbon-based fuels, but um, you will still see that, that fossil fuels are anticipated to, be, to, to continue to be, to be used. So short of a technology that can mitigate those CO2 emissions at the source, um, it's hard to see a path forward where we could quickly get to, to reduced emissions of, of greenhouse gases. On the right side of this slide shows a, a quote from the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, the, the Secretariat of the same that talks about the role that CCUS is going to have to play in terms of gigaton reductions, again, um, that are anticipated to be borne by this, by this technology uh, going forward, starting as soon as 2030 on through 2050, and then, and then in the back half of this century. So again, I just wanted to, to emphasize that at the end of the day, we are having programs like this and we are trying to advance these technologies because we are trying to address climate change. And in a, in, in a society with continued use of fossil fuels for the foreseeable future, it is difficult to see a path forward with reduced greenhouse gas emissions that does not have this, this technology at scale in some form or fashion. Next slide, please. Um, I also wanted to emphasize that um, for those of you that um, read the climate policy literature, and of course, as we know, the, the negotiators for the Paris Agreement will be meeting here in Scotland in, in a month at the so-called COP26 to hopefully wrap up the rule book for the Paris Agreement. They're finalizing the rules on, on carbon trading. It is anticipated that, so un, under the Paris Agreement, the, the two degree C temperature increase, which is one of the nominal goals in, in the Paris Agreement, but there's ambition to hold that increase to 1.5 degrees C. If you translate that two degrees C number into a parts per million of CO2 in the atmosphere, that number is 450 parts per million. And um, there's a CO2 monitor on the top of the volcano in, in, in Hawaii that takes that temperature reading daily, uh, not, not temperature reading, that concentration of CO2 measurement daily. You can go onto the website and see that. Um, that CO2 concentration is uniform um, over, over the surface of the earth. Well, we are rapidly climbing towards that 450 uh, uh, parts per million number. Um, and I think it's anticipated that we're going to hit that 2035, 2040. It, it, it may even be, be sooner. So it looks as though if we stay on the path that we're on, we're apt to end up with um, excess CO2 loading in the atmosphere. And, and then we have to start removing that CO2 from the atmosphere. And indeed, people have been working on technologies, uh, so-called carbon dioxide removal technologies for, for a long time. Those are also now starting to be deployed commercially. And those also typically involve um, the resulting utilization and or storage of CO2 after you capture it. So it's one thing to take CO2 out of the atmosphere 
But once you've got that molecule, what do you do with it? You either have to store it locally or you have to utilize it or do something similar. So regardless of your views of the energy mix, fossil and renewables going forward in a world in which we're going to be taking CO2 out of the atmosphere, carbon capture utilization and storage is critical as well. And here are just two examples of those technologies. One is so-called bioenergy with, with carbon capture and storage. That's where typically, for example, you might be co-firing biomass with a um, with with a fossil fuel and then capturing the resulting CO2 emissions and then geologically storing it. That's called that's called BEX. Um, biomass, as we all know, absorbs CO2 when they grow. And of course, this has to be inappropriately managed from a technical point of view and uh, uh, addressed in, in a proper way from a carbon accounting point of view. Um, but done right, this can be a, a carbon neutral or even a carbon negative approach. Um, so BEX is an example of a carbon removal technology that involves carbon capture and storage. Another one is, is the technology on the right called direct air capture. There are a couple of companies um, that are pursuing projects like that around the world. One is Carbon Engineering up in, up in Canada. Uh, the other is a European company called Climeworks. And they're deploying devices that take CO2 out of the atmosphere and then uh, use it in some way. Um, and, and indeed, I think the largest DAC, as it's called, direct air capture facility, was just commissioned on Iceland in, in Iceland a couple of weeks ago. Um, Oxy Low Carbon Ventures is uh, in the midst of developing a direct air capture project in the Permian Basin of, of Texas and, and on and on and on. But I just wanted to leave you with the notion that in a world of CO2 overshoot in the atmosphere, in the, in the terms of the Paris Agreement, that carbon capture and storage, I think, and many other experts believe, is going to have to be deployed at scale to manage the CO2 emissions that are already in the atmosphere, even if we never emit another ton of CO2. Next slide, please. And so this slide just shows, so this shows the status of, of carbon capture and storage projects based upon uh, their capture capacity and storage capacity. That's the, that's, that's the y-axis and the x-axis is um, years going back to 2010. This is data from the Global CCS Institute um, as, as presented in a recent presentation by the International Center for Sustainable Carbon. And you'll see that, uh, you know, over time, the, the, red, the red bars, the red pieces of the bar show operational projects, and, and those have slowly been, been creeping up. But, but overall, you know, we kind of experienced a little bit of a trough a few years ago. And these projects, uh, just like any other, any other relatively new technology from, from aviation to wind to, to what have you, th th these, these technologies, although this, this technology, although pieces of them have certainly been around for a long time, it's, it's difficult economically in particular to stitch them all, all together. Um, and that's the, you know, the, the so-called valley of death. It's you know, trying to get a technology out of the lab, such as here at the University of Wyoming, and get it invested and get it tested at the pilot scale, then a large scale demonstration, and then, and then commercially deploy. That's, that's difficult to do. And, and this technology is on that path. But we're now seeing an increase in recent projects, and some of that is due to, to the recent um, incentives that, that Dr. Friedman had mentioned, 45Q and the California Low Carbon Fuel Standard. But some of that is also due to a, an improved regulatory environment, or a, at least a regulatory environment that's now better understood and also improved economics. But we're hoping uh, with the components of the, of the infrastructure bill and maybe hopefully as well in the, um, in the budget bill, uh, the $3.5 trillion package that is also attempting to move, that it, this could be a, the proverbial game changer for this technology and certainly should, in theory anyway, open up a lot of additional opportunities for states. N next slide, please. 
So I just want to close here. And yes, as I said, I'm in I'm I'm in Laramie. I thought I could use Wyoming, and uh, I could be accused of being. Um, you know, being too much of a homebody here, but 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 Wyoming is a state I think that has um, has had progressive carbon capture, utilization, and storage policies for a long time, and there are other states like it as well: North Dakota, Illinois, um, West Virginia, Texas, others. Um, so even though I'm just going to close out here talking about Wyoming, I, I don't want to leave you with the impression that that Wyoming is the only state that has these policies. I'm sitting here in Wyoming, so I happen to know a lot about it. So I, I just thought I would I would close with that. So to answer the question, are, are there what can a state do that wants to advance, attract? CCUS, either from an economic development point of view, as a climate mitigation policy, what have you. <clears throat> and in fact, there is a lot that you can do. And so on, on the left side, it shows the um, CCUS related policies that are in place in, in Wyoming. So Dr. Friedman mentioned about poor space. Um, I actually think I, I did one of the first poor space deals back in private practice about 20 years ago. Um, there are states that have defined laws about uh, how to do these projects, and, and that includes, for example, who, who owns a poor space, long-term stewardship, permitting, and on and on and on. And those, those model regulations were issued by the Interstate Oil and Gas Compact Commission, I think, 15 years ago now. So, so a lot of this stuff isn't new, at least on the regulatory point of view. So Wyoming, like other states, uh, took those IOGCC recommendations in terms of statutes and laws associated with carbon capture and utilization, and they put them on the books. They, they tweaked them uh, for local conditions, uh, um, but there, there is no shortage of model state laws and regulations either issued by organizations like the IOGCC or that already exist on the books today in states that have been pursuing this technology for, for more than a decade. Wyoming also has, I think, the only low carbon fuel standard, uh, the only low carbon emission standard for power plants that exists in the United States. And that effectively encourages power companies to look at carbon capture and storage as a technology. Um, as noted, Wyoming has primacy for one of the major federal regulatory programs that, that governs the injection and storage of CO2 in the subsurface. And that is class six of the underground injection control program. North Dakota is another state with primacy. And as Dr. Friedman mentioned, other states are other states are pursuing that. Uh, I could give you reasons why I think this is a wise thing to do. My advice to any state would be if you want to attract carbon capture and storage projects, one of the things you should look at doing is pursuing primacy for the class six program. And, and on and on and on. Um, we have government agencies here that are focused on carbon capture utilization. I'm sitting in this school, the School of Energy Resources, that has had a focus for almost 15 years at the University of Wyoming on, on CCUS. So there's, there's just a lot of rich stuff at the state level that, that a um, like-minded state could, could put into place. Um, secondly, we, we are blessed in Wyoming with, with infrastructure. So we have this test facility called the Integrated Test Facility, which is up in, up in Gillette. It's one of two uh, similar test facilities in the United States. The other is managed by, by the Southern Company. Um, and those, those are test facilities where researchers and others who are trying to test new CO2 capture technologies and utilization technologies can come to come to bring their bring their experiments uh, for for lack of a better term. But if but if you get the question as an energy regulator, well, where do I go in, in the United States to test a technology for CO2 capture? I'd call the Southern Company and then I'd, I'd call the state of Wyoming. Um, 
And uh, so, yeah, so, so there are test facilities for this as well. Um, there are a handful of states that have CO2 pipelines to physically move CO2. Wyoming is one of them. Texas is another. Um, there are C CO2 pipelines in Colorado. Um, CO2 can be used for, for enhanced oil recovery, as Dr. Friedman mentioned, and there are states that, that have those, those industries, and you obviously know, know who you are. And then again, all credit to the U.S. Department of Energy and Congress for, for appropriations over the decades, literally. Um, the Department of Energy has been funding um, this technology and these projects for, for some time. Um, and Jesse mentioned some of those some, some of those appropriation levels, and that's why we're all excited about about this new legislation that's pending. But there are states that have been you know been fortunate to to have received these fundings to try to advance these these projects. And Wyoming is is one, and there's numerous other states that have that are really leading on this as well. Again, Illinois, North Dakota, West Virginia, Texas, and, and on and on and on. Um, so with that, I think I will, I may have run over a little bit, but I think that brings me to the end of my talk. So thank you very much. Great, thank you so much, Kip. That was fascinating, both of your presentations. And I just, I can't help but comment on a few things that caught my attention. One is the urgency and the necessity of investing in these technologies or, or learning more about them. And I say that coming from an East Coast state where frankly, we don't talk about this very often. I did hear about it many years ago when I was at the energy office. And I think at that time, Ernie Moniz was the head of DOE and he came to the state to talk about I think grid modernization and a group of researchers at Brown were very interested in carbon capture technology, which was like, really? This is what we're going to talk about, but it, you know, it's. I think it's reflected in what you're saying. That's one thing. Secondly, the bipartisan nature of this, I think, is really important in this polarized time. It's really great to find things that everyone can can agree upon. Um, third, the challenge from Dr. Friedman to engage for more states to engage. I think that's really important, and I'm going to be reaching out to some of my colleagues in on the East Coast to talk about this. And then fourth, I come from a background before I came up to the energy office, a um, university background, and we trained a lot of young, we are training a lot of young people. Um, so I think the opportunities um, and the necessity to have more young people trained in this technology was really an important point. Um, so those are my things. We have lots of questions and a couple of questions. I have lots of questions, but I'll start with the questions that came in on the chat. And there's one for each of you. Uh, the first one, let's see, where is this? I've lost it. It was a question for Jesse. Um, Jesse, you noted numerous infrastructure bill provisions, assuming enactment, fingers crossed. Any clarification on eligible recipients, which may be most pertinent for states to apply for directly? Which should states keep an eye on for applicability to companies, universities, utilities, et cetera? And I just want to add to that, I think there might be several tranches of states and some like the East Coast states where we don't have a lot of resources that have caused us to look into this technology already. And then the other states that, as um, Kip said, have been very active for years, West Virginia, Texas, Colorado, et cetera. So your thoughts? Yeah, um, that's a great question. I don't have a, a great answer, but I think the thing to do is really to keep an eye on the funding opportunity announcements from the Department of Energy. Um, most of the big dollar items like the pilots and demonstrations and the director capture prizes, those are going to probably go, be going to project developers in terms of developing the technologies. But at the same time, this administration has shown a real interest um, at Office of Carbon Management and Fossil Energy in directly engaging at the community level. And I think that would include states as well. Um, and so one um, program that was actually, I don't know that much about it, but it was just recently announced is the Local Energy Action Program. Um, and it's an initiative that's directly engaging um, local communities that have historical ties to fossil fuel industries. Um, so I will throw that in the chat so you guys can take a look at that. But I think um, DOE, the Office of Carbon Management and Fossil Energy is kind of taking a fresh look at how they are engaging with communities specifically. So I think that is definitely something to keep an eye on. Um, and then of course, this carbon utilization program kind of TBD on how they're actually going to do it, but it's certainly aimed at 
states in particular. So those are just a couple of thoughts there. Great, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, the next question is from David Merchant for, I think this is for you, Kip. And I wanna thank David, um, start off by thanking him for letting us know that the Houston CCUS hub is already moving forward and he included a link which we can share. Um, the question I have involves 45Q and deep saline storage rights. It took over two years to approve the first wells through the federal government. So who owns the onshore deep saline rights, saline rights across America? Texas and Louisiana are moving towards state rights, Telos Energy, et cetera. Uh, let's see, was the first to achieve deep saline injection, which is located in Texas, offshore waters, which is not federal. Any, any comments on that? Yes, and by the way, I happen to know I happen to know David. So, so David, um, although I haven't seen him for a long time, but he he is a, a, a separate expert in this field. So, I might encourage people to to contact David as well. So, the um, yes, so it's it's it it historically has taken some time uh, to get these permits through the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, and the states that have primacy, it is anticipated that that will go a bit faster. And when I say that, that doesn't mean it's a race to the bottom, because these, under all circumstances, these are going to be stringently regulated facilities as they as they must, because failure is not an option. Um, but it is at the end of the day for storage anyway. You know, all geology is local, and a a lot of the knowledge of local geology, state based geology exist at the state level because um, states have geologic surveys the environmental regulators generally have been dealing with you know in injection operations and other contexts so there's practical reasons why it is it is hoped that states with primacy may see um, a shortening of of permitting times um, that's one reason it's not the only reason why i'm in favor of of primacy in terms of the question of storage rights so um, what I'm about to say is not is not legal advice, but again, 20 years ago we did a poor space deal, um, where uh, you, you know I, I you can in in the you consult your local real estate lawyer, but generally you can make a reservation of rights um, as part of a property transaction, and that's what we did. There there are states that have that have adopted what is called the American rule, and the American rule is that whoever owns a surface states. The surface estate owns the pore space, and the pore space is the storage volume, and you own that the pores all the way down. Um, and so, um, I think, and then there are some states that have have put that have put that law into um, put that rule into law, and that's what Wyoming has done um, for federal lands. Uh, there are legal arguments as to who owns a poor space under under federal lands, um, but that has not yet been tested uh, legally to the best of my to the best of my ability to the best of my knowledge. Um, there have been bills introduced that are, would would fix that gap, and then um, there are a host of um, potential changes to 45Q. Some of them, quite frankly, might not be as positive. Others would be positive, including direct pay, and those are part of the um, broader um, budget bill that is, it, you know, is still is still being negotiated on the Hill, and the status of that is unclear. Um, but we can send you some information about what's pending for possible changes to 45Q. Great, thank you. Um, it's clear that this is a, a very technical area. And I guess one of my questions I have is, is what kinds of projects, if you were a state that's that's new to this, what kinds of things should should those states be thinking about? Like, do you have any comments on the kind of work that's going on in California with the, the procurement standards for cement, for example, and starting to move, try to get involved in the carbon capture technology by requiring that products that are used within the state like steel or cement are low carbon. Is that, is that an opportunity? And I don't know if there's any provisions in the infrastructure bill that will address those kinds of issues. I, can, I, can I would love to hear you, Jeff, yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Kim. <laughs> you can handle the poor space. I can talk about California. Um, 
<laughs> yeah, I think Cal California is a really interesting case because it both has uh, a lot of heavy industry that would be a potential opportunity for capture. But then they're also doing a lot of work around procurement um, and performance standards. So I think Marion Marion had circulated to us an article. I think it was just yesterday or just just very recently that California has actually passed legislation that will require a 40% reduction in um, embodied carbon for cement in the state. So that's a performance standard, kind of what we would think of as like a stick. And then there's the carrot, which would be a procurement standard, which is what um, in California by clean is and, and looking across a couple of different materials in the building sector to incentivize use of um, clean materials and a couple of other states are looking at by clean too um, and municipalities and localities and so I think you know definitely depends on the state's resources if they have a, have a lot of heavy industry or um, you know power generation opportunities then they certainly can be looking at capture and storage options and those are typically sort of in, in the mid region. Um, but then also every state is gonna need your materials, right? And so they can be looking at the utilization end of things and looking at whether it's performance or procurement standards to kind of drive investment in those materials as well. And what caught my attention with that is that it did seem to be again, bipartisan um, in the cement uh, manufacturers were deeply engaged and very comfortable with the legislation that was passed. So those are the kinds of win-win opportunities that I think we, we all are looking for. Absolutely. Um, yeah. Kip, do you have anything to add? Is this something that you talk about in, in Wyoming when you're looking at, at opportunities to export this technology, for example? Absolutely. Yeah. So we, so again, I'm sitting here in, in the School of Energy Resources and, and, and we have programs on utilization. Um, some of it is not focused on utilization of the CO2 molecule itself, but certainly um, non-combustion uses of coal. So coal to building materials, um, things like that. Yes. And so I think there, there are states like Wyoming that that very much um, by the nature of their resources are really eager and have been literally spending a decade or more to to work on these products. But at the end of the day, we need people to to purchase those those products. Um, there's only 500,000 people in the state of Wyoming and there's only so many bricks that those people need or or co2 based based products but it would be it would be wonderful where um if there was a you know a relationship between the states where there there are states that might be equipped to to do these kind of projects and then you know have the have the carbon reduction activities take place here for reasons of geology or or what have you or texas offshore texas and then have those products you know, accepted in the marketplace. Um, and we're certainly seeing that in California. California, as noted under the California Low Carbon Fuel Standard Program, they acknowledge carbon capture and storage. The California Low Carbon, Stu carbon uh, uh, Fuel Standard recognizes direct air capture projects. I mentioned DAC. Um, and you don't even have to do a DAC project in California. You can do it elsewhere and it should if it's done consistent with the regulations it is creditable cr creditable in in california um so yes there's lots of ways here through market mechanisms and wise regulations where i think states can can collaborate and it's it's an exciting time to be to be involved in this technology and these projects yeah i have to agree and i guess that's our last question you only have one more minute but what advice do you have for states and state energy officials who are interested in learning more about CCUS technology and policy, particularly around infrastructure deployment? And I think are the resources at both of your entities, and I think you've already shared some, but why don't, as a final comment, you can just reiterate the best places for us to go to, to learn more. So I'm going to jump in here and say, and this is not to create more work for Jesse, but you can't go wrong. You, you can't go wrong by picking up the phone and calling Jesse or start at the Great Plains Institute website. It is just a, it's just a, it's just a wealth of information. So I, I would start there. Thank you, Kip. And I'm going to punt it to my colleague who runs our regional deployment initiative. And so that is really looking at the state and regional deployment and they are working 
kind of, they call it carbon capture ready. I think it's already been put in the chat, um, but <clears throat> they're really looking at kind of creating the ecosystem of policies at the state level that will be needed for, um, for the industry. Right now, they're focusing on CO transport infrastructure and storage, um, but I think it's a really great kind of um, place to start in terms of having some of those conversations. And what's interesting to me is being an East Coaster in our um, state working groups, we have a lot of the states that you would expect and anticipate it, like in the mid-continent region, but we also have Pennsylvania and Maryland. So other states are getting involved and kind of, and <laughs> that's right, and, and getting involved in, in the carbon capture space, which is really exciting. That really is exciting. All right. Well, I want to thank you both so much. This has been really a terrific um, educational opportunity for me. I really appreciate it. And thanks to Nazio for, as usual, organizing a, a great set of panelists. Turn it back to thank you. you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm, my name is Edward O'Brien. I'm the lead economist at the Louisiana State Energy Office. Um, and today we're going to be talking to you about the state perspectives on CCUS policy. Um, we're going to look basically at what uh, CCUS considerations from uh, that are from a state perspective, such as federal tax incentives, and EPA decisions to grant states class uh, six primacy. Um, speaking today will be Kevin Connors and Jason Lanclaw. Kevin Connors is a principal policy and regulatory strategist at the EERC, where he works with a multidisciplinary team of scientists, engineers, and business professionals to integrate legal and regulatory policy, economics, and tax perspectives with applied research related to incremental oil recovery, unconventional oil recovery, and CO2 capture and geologic storage. Uh, Jason Lanclaw uh, has worked with the Louisiana Department of Natural Resources since August of 2018 and serves as the director of the State Energy Office. Um, Jason serves as the Louisiana Coalition representative for the state and Midwest region on the Carbon Capture Coalition and serves as the executive board for the National Association of State Energy Officials. He's a member of the uh, Governor's Climate Initiative Task Force looking to reduce greenhouse gas emissions in Louisiana to net zero by 2050. And speaking first will be Kevin. Kevin, take it away. Thank you, Edward. I appreciate it. Uh, Thank you for this opportunity to present. Edward, you can go to the next slide, please, or whoever's controlling can go to the next slide. <clears throat> so my name is Kevin Connors. As, as Edward mentioned, I am uh, the uh, work for the Energy Environmental Research Center at the University of North Dakota. Uh, I'm, I manage the PCOR partnership for the Plains CO2 Reduction Partnership uh, Program. And I'll talk a little bit about that. And my other function at the EERC is I'm principal policy and regulatory strategist. I have a background in, in geology, a background in oil and gas. I started my career as a well site geologist in, in the oil fields in, in North Dakota, specifically in the Bakken, uh, and then uh, eventually transitioned to the state of North Dakota, where I worked for the Oil and Gas Regulatory Agency. Uh, spent eight years with the state of North Dakota uh, in oil and gas regulation. And, uh, and, and of note for today's talk is, is uh, I had the opportunity in the the privilege to lead North Dakota's efforts in, in getting class six primacy. Uh, so I helped develop the regulatory program, uh, helped write the regulations that are in place today, and then also uh, was there and, and able to help uh, the state become the, be, help North Dakota become the first state in the nation to be, to have class six primacy granted from the EPA. Uh, I've worked for the EERC now for, for two years or a little over two years. Uh, and then in addition, in my role where I'm uh, the principal policy and regulatory strategist uh, of note there is I've helped uh, some of our, our commercial CCS project developers in the state of North Dakota, some of our project partners, uh, put together some of the first storage facility permits is what they're called in North Dakota. Uh, they're permits to store, uh, store CO2 geologically. And so I uh, had the opportunity to work with the state, develop the regulations, and now I'm turning around uh, working with some uh, commercial developers uh, and, and, and developing the permits, the first permits uh, based on those rules and regulations. Uh, next slide, please. 
Real quick about the ERC, I don't have a whole lot of time, so I'm just going to hit on a, a few things about the ERC. We're a, a non-teaching branch of the University of North Dakota. We're located in Grand Forks, North Dakota. Uh, beautiful fall weather here. Uh, it's interesting here. Kip said about Wyoming, we're, we're experiencing seven degree, 70 degree weather, and it's, it's just the perfect fall. Um, but we are a, we're a business unit of, of the University of North Dakota. We're located on UNB campus. Uh, our core research priorities and, and is in coal utilization and, and emissions, uh, carbon management, which I'll be talking about today, uh, where we have over 20 years of experience working in, in CCS or CCUS, oil and gas as well, uh, alternative fuels, re renewable energies, and the energy water nexus. So, you know, our, we have a, a long history at the ERC with a unique culture. Uh, I can't get into all that today, but, but we've been researching carbon emissions uh, for over 50 years. So uh, next slide, please. Talk, I'm going to talk a little bit about the PCOR partnership, not a whole lot, um, but PCOR partnership, we're one of four regional carbon sequestration partnership initiatives sponsored by the U.S. Department of Energy. And um, we'll just go to the next slide here and I'll talk a little bit more about just focused on PCOR. Uh, so the EERC has always led the PCOR partnership. We're going on uh, over 18 years now. It's, it, it began in 2003, uh, where we characterized the region. Uh, and, and when we talk about characterization, you know, we've, we've, we continue to characterize our region in terms of looking at our geology, understanding the formations that are ideal to uh, inject and store large volumes of CO2, whether that be uh, in oil and gas reservoirs for enhanced oil recovery. Uh, or, or in saline reservoirs for, for geologic storage of CO2. Uh, and then we also identified the major stationary sources in the region and we performed like a source sink matching, uh, identify the infrastructure that's needed uh, in our region. And, and I could talk, I, I mean, I could talk more and more about that. I don't have time today to talk about the work that PCOR is doing, uh, but I do want to talk about in, in 2003, in the early stages of PCOR, one of the things that was identified uh, was the need for regulations uh, or at least regulatory certainty for project developers to make the investment to develop uh, commercial CO2 storage projects. Uh, and the map you see there on the right, the yellow outline is the original PCOR partnership region. Uh, in 2019, when the PCOR partnership initiative uh, began, the region was expanded to include all of Wyoming, all of Montana, all of British Columbia and Alaska. And now today we're partnered with the University of Wyoming School of Energy Resources and the, and the uh, University of Alaska Fairbanks Institute of Northern Engineering. Um, and, and we're focused today on commercial deployments. So we went through this progression in PCOR, is, it, it ties right to North Dakota, where we characterized the region. Uh, we did some small scale field validation testing. We did commercial demonstration, namely CO2 EOR at, at Bell Creek, which is operated by Denbury Resources in Southeastern Montana. And then today we're focused on commercially deploying CCS or CCUS across the region. And that's our focus. We're trying to identify the challenges that are getting in the way of that commercial deployment. Uh, next slide, please. So I just wanted to kind of give you a brief overview there. And now we're going to focus on North Dakota and North Dakota's efforts. Uh, can you go to the next slide? To tell the North Dakota story, Kip actually alluded to it. And I was going to talk a little bit more about it. Kip mentioned it was about 15 years ago. It was actually 14 years ago. Uh, the IOGCC created the um, Carbon Geologic Storage Task Force. And that task force, that they, we partnered with the, through the PCOR partnership, through the US Department of Energy, the National Energy Technology Laboratory and the IOGCC, uh, there was this work group put together or this task force uh, that started developing what Kip, Kip mentioned it, the model statute and model regulations, how states can regulate this, this activity in their states. Um, and so in 2007, the IOGCC task force developed the, the first model statute, model regulations for states to then take and customize. And I'll get to that and how that plays into North Dakota. But first, I want to get your, direct your attention to the diagram on the screen here. So uh, for states to understand this, the way I, the, this, is, this is right from these IOGCC efforts, um, everything in the yellow squared area, that falls under the federal US EPA underground injection control program class six regulations right out of the Safe Drinking Water Act and the jurisdiction uh, of class six. Everything outside of the yellow squared area is, is a state's rights issue or, or, or it's, um, there's, some, there's state involvement needed for CO2 storage if it's going to occur in the state. And so that's a, that's a really key point to understand that even if a state does not want to uh, go after and obtain class six primacy, 
there are some components of a CO2 storage project that need to be addressed by the state regulators. Uh, for instance, in the beginning and exploratory phases, uh, pore space. We've talked a lot about pore space and what that looks like in states. And I can talk, I'll talk a little bit about North Dakota and what we've done there in the state of North Dakota. But there's also exploratory type permits where you would need to drill uh, a wells to core and characterize the geology in, in, the, in the project area. And then also maybe even uh, shoot three uh, seismic surveys and, and obtain geophysical surveys of the area that falls under state jurisdiction. Uh, and then also the, the post closure phase after the CO2 um, operations end, after the EPA jurisdiction ends of the, the, the monitoring of a closed site, what happens to that closed site? And, and there's, uh, there's certainly a, a way forward in, in terms of the way North Dakota and, and Wyoming and some other states have done it, where the state uh, would step in in those instances. Uh, next slide, please. So, in 2007, I mentioned the model statute, model uh, regulations were developed by the IOGCC. North Dakota took that, those models. And, and in 2008, uh, at the request of then Governor Hoven, he's now Senator Hoven, uh, a work group was formed in North Dakota. And that work group uh, was a private, uh, a public and private partnership consisting of representatives from the uh, North Dakota Oil and Gas Regulatory Agency, the Attorney General's Office and the Department of Environmental Quality. Uh, also, we had uh, the Lignite Energy Council and the North Dakota Petroleum Council, our trade associations for our uh, fossil fuel industries in the state. And then we also had a representative from the Energy and Environmental Research Center and a couple of energy attorneys. Uh, and they were tasked with developing a regulatory framework for long-term storage of CO2. And they were also tasked with addressing ownership of pore space and geologic strata. Uh, so that work group in 2008, developed uh, what was introduced to the legislature in 2009. Two bills came out of that. The first bill granted the regulatory authority to the oil and gas agency. Uh, it, it created a couple of trust funds and I could talk more about that in detail if anyone has any, has any questions. And then they developed a pathway uh, for the transition of long-term liability from a project operator to the state of North Dakota. And I could talk about in, in more detail about that if anyone has any questions. Uh, Poor space was addressed. They gave poor space to the overlying surface estate. So the, the surface owner owns the poor space and they made that, they prohibited the severance of that poor space. Uh, that legislation also addressed the way to unitize or in the words of North Dakota statute, amalgamate the poor space uh, uh, to develop a project centric regulatory program uh, to allow uh, for uh, forced amalgamation or any non-consenting pore space owners would be pulled into the project after project developers showed that they obtained at least 60% of the pore space. I can easily uh, answer any questions on that as well. Uh, next slide, please. So here's, here's the timeline. Uh, I talked about the 2007 IOGCC effort. I talked about the 2008 work group effort, 2009 legislation. That was followed by the oil and gas division uh, went into a rulemaking and they developed uh, geologic storage of carbon dioxide regulations. So in April of 2010, North Dakota was the first state in the nation to have a complete and comprehensive framework in place for regulating this activity. Uh, followed by uh, at the very end of 2010, EPA uh, developed the class six rule, published that. And then in 2009, the next legislative session in North Dakota, the state legislature uh, appropriated funding and created one full-time employee to go out and obtain classics primacy. And that, that was me. That, that was the opportunity I was given. I was in the, currently a, a field inspector in the field office in the Williston district. And, and they gave me an opportunity to move my family down to Bismarck and take on that new role. And that's where uh, I had the opportunity to start uh, those efforts for North Dakota to get classics primacy. It took about two years to negotiate with EPA, go through a rulemaking to uh, um, amend the current regulations in place and and adopt the class six requirements. And then North Dakota was able to apply for primacy. That process took approximately five years from 2013 to 2018. I welcome questions on that. Next slide, please. We've talked a lot about 45Q tax credit. I'm not gonna spend a whole lot of time here. Uh, the tax credit, there's a start of construction deadline, January 1st, 2026. I will talk about that in my last slide in this presentation. It's a 12 year tax credit. We've already mentioned $35 a ton for CO2 EOR, $50 a ton for saline storage. We've talked about the West Coast low carbon fuel standards markets. Uh, and we're seeing uh, the, our ethanol industry in North Dakota and the PCOR partnership region, which includes Iowa and Nebraska and South Dakota, Minnesota, uh, accelerate CCS 
uh, with the business case of taking advantage of both the 45Q tax credit and the California low carbon fuel standards markets. Uh, and then North Dakota has also enacted some uh, tax incentives, some state tax incentives in place uh, that, that focus around coal uh, capture and then CO2 EOR as well. Uh, but I can be happy to answer any questions on that. Next slide, please. So class six primacy, what does it mean? This is the current outlook. I look forward to seeing a little bit more green on this map with Louisiana and, and some of the other states. Uh, one of the things it means, it means a lot, and I'd be happy to, to talk more about that. But one thing I want to highlight is the, the permitting process and what it takes. So right now, today, project developers developing a project in any state other than North Dakota and Wyoming, EPA is saying it would take about 18 months or more to issue a class six permit. In states like North Dakota and Wyoming, we're, we're working with them closely, Kip, uh, in partnership with Kip and, and his team. And we're being told by both regulators in both states that it's going to take 12 months or less to get a permit. And, and so let's talk a little bit about, about what that means. Uh, next slide, please. So in North Dakota, we've worked really closely with the regulator. We've issued so far, uh, we've, like I've mentioned, we've partnered, or some of our, our project developers that we're partnered with, we've filed three permits already in the state. And we're seeing about a seven month approval process. And I think it could even get better, but these are the first. So we're learning as we go. Um, but we've, we've really dialed in this process and we think, we think clearly we, uh, we, we advise our project developers, we can, get a, we can get permit approval in seven months in North Dakota. That includes all the regulatory reviews, public comment periods, hearings, and, and all the regulatory approvals you need. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so this is my last slide. I just want to talk about this. This is the generalized timeline for project development, starting from site screening uh, to feasibility to project design and permit application development. Uh, this has acquiring pore space and negotiating access to that pore space. And then it has submitting your permits and receiving your regulatory approvals. And it, on there, we have the 45Q start of construction deadline, uh, January 1st, 2026. What I want to point out here is, the, is those time ranges in this timeline. So we think best case scenario, uh, we, can, we can develop a project and get permit approval in a state with primacy that can approve the project in 12 months or less, we can get that 30 months. Uh, in, the long, in the long end of the timeline here, uh, it, we, it takes about 54 months. Today, from today, we have 51 months until that start of construction deadline. Uh, we're told from some of our project developers, certain project developers that having permit in hand is key to receiving the investment necessary to build the capture equipment on those projects. So timing is very important. The amount of time it takes to develop these projects, very little can change on the, on the front end of this, of this timeline. What can change is that permit approval process. And if EPA is in there and they're taking multiple years to approve a permit, that's gonna, that's gonna cause issues for project developers that are investing to develop their projects. So that's one, one instance or one case for states to have plastics primacy to enable projects in their states. Uh, I had 10 minutes to talk. I probably went over time, but I just wanted to, to, I welcome any questions and thank you for this opportunity. Thank you, Kevin. And next up is Jason Landclough from the Louisiana State Energy Office. Take it away, Jason. Hey, good afternoon. Thanks so much, Kevin, for, uh, for really kind of setting the stage on the state's perspective. I had the, the pleasure to be with Dr. Glenn Morrell yesterday and um, they're doing some incredible work in Wyoming. I know that North Dakota and Wyoming work very well together. We, we appreciate you guys blazing a trail on, on the primacy applications and, and really kind of kind of giving other states a playbook in terms of, of what they need to look for. So I appreciate all the all the thoughts and, I, and I'm gonna echo quite a few of those uh, as I go through some things today. So I'm, I'm not gonna do slides. I just wanna talk a little bit about Louisiana and, and potentially just what states need to look for as they're going through this process. And, and so oftentimes we get asked, what, what do states need to do and why, why would they get primacy? And I think what it boils down to is that even though states don't have CO2 sources, uh, there are also opportunities just from a storage and transportation standpoint, and also a regional hub transportation standpoint. So what we're starting to see is that a lot of states are starting to work together. They have a tremendous source material in the Midwest, also on the West Coast, and also in the Louisiana and, and Texas industrial corridors. All, all those sources of CO2 are significant resources when you look at what we need to do to try to get that CO2 very safely in a geological storage formation. So in terms of Louisiana on how we got to where we are today, and I'll talk just briefly about that. So we started this process about uh, three years ago. 
main, mainly looking at our CO2 emissions. And uh, but Secretary Harris and I had the pleasure to, to sit down with our governor and just kind of talk through the big picture state of, of what Louisiana looked like and what we needed to do long term. And, and his, his leadership has really stood up our climate task force and initiated a, a lot of discussion on, on where we need to go from a clean energy standpoint and also a long term emission management standpoint. And we, we like to refer to that as our carbon economy in Louisiana. And, and what we're trying to do long term is, is start to tap into that those 220 million metric tons per year that we're seeing. And what's unique about Louisiana is that the bulk of those emission sources are coming from our industrial partners. So it's a lot of source material. So what we started to do after a lot of time and research, and I saw that uh, Jesse and others from the Carbon Capture Coalition were on, uh, Los Alamos Lab and many others have done lots of modeling that's looked at geological storage. They kind of help tag certain states that have tremendous infrastructure opportunities and also storage opportunities. Uh, Louisiana has been working very closely with that coalition to, to really start to, to look at what does the geological storage uh, outlook look like in Louisiana. And to be honest, it, it looks uh, very, very positive. Uh, we've done a lot of work with our partners and project developers to, to, to do preliminary characterization. Uh, we've gone through the process right now through um, just a, for applying for class six primacy. That's a, as Kevin mentioned, that's an, a very labor intensive process to do that. Uh, both primacy applications for Wyoming and North Dakota took almost six years, if not over a little six years to review those applications. So one of the things that we focused in on very early in this process was that we needed to engage very often and very frequently with EPA and to work very closely with them to number one, make sure that their staff in the UIC program had appropriations to be able to hire and retain staff to be able to review these permits. And then also take a look at what, what our staff look like. So the, are the 40 folks that we have in our Office of Conservation, is that going to be enough for an influx of CO2 permits? So the reality is, is that we've, we've spent a lot of time on training. We've spent a lot of time on trying to make sure that we're ready for an influx of applications. EPA has been a tremendous partner, both at the headquarters level and at the regional level. Uh, I think they see this as a priority. We, we're working very closely with the coalition to make sure that those appropriations continue to flow into the UIC program, especially for states that have taken that ownership to, to look at getting class six primacy. So the good news to report is that we're looking at the first quarter of next year to hopefully get primacy. Um, that's just kudos to our team that's been working uh, just nonstop and tirelessly to try to make sure that application has gotten in. The other things that, uh, have helped very much in Louisiana is that we had existing legislation in place that had passed as far back as 2009, which really set the stage and set up a Gulf, uh, a Gulf Sequestration Act in Louisiana to look at long-term liability storage for the state. So Kevin mentioned that as well. Poor space ownership is a significant uh, uh, piece of information that states need to consider when you look at all different phases of oil and gas development or even any type of poor space ownership. The state plays a critical role in that, and that's uh, very evident in Louisiana. We have a state mineral and energy board that has traditionally done oil and gas leasing for many, many years in Louisiana. And obviously they've done lots of uh, well permitting and oil and gas legislation, but they haven't done a lot of leasing related to CO2. So it's not that CO2 injection or permitting is new. It's been happening for a long period of time. We just haven't done lease agreements that look like that. So. The other thing that we focused very early on was making sure that we had a committee that was stood up. We, we called it our ad hoc committee on legislation and core space. We had a lot of input from industry, from developers, from attorneys that looked at long term liability and tried to start to paint the picture for what that would look like if they filed a permit today. So I will tell you that Louisiana has had um, tremendous success in terms of trying to, to work through that committee. We had lots of information that was put forward. We're trying to, to work through all of that to make sure that we have a very efficient process when people do file, file permits. We've already had one class six permit that's been filed in West Louisiana for a company called Gulf Coast Sequestration. And we fully anticipate that within the next several months after primacy is granted to Louisiana, we've had numerous companies that have told us that they're waiting to, to click go on their primacy application once we do, get, or, or not their permit application, once we do get primacy. So, some exciting announcements uh, that, that I will share is that uh, we, we have entered into several lease agreements with, uh, with major companies across Louisiana for the lease and ownership of poor space on state owned lands in Louisiana. One is a very large blue hydrogen facility. Um, some of the others are gonna be announced uh, very soon. 
but that's a very exciting thing. And I think that, again, it's kudos to the teams that, that have done the research and worked with other states to understand what that process will look like. So uh, it's extremely exciting to work on a policy objective and, and really put a lot of time and effort into it as a state and actually start to see the interest and see the project announcements start to come through the door. So those things are extremely exciting. Uh, we, we fully anticipate that our, our mineral board is going to be busy. And, and I think that when we look at what this means for us as a state, all the legislation that's been talked about earlier is a critical piece to, to turning this industry into something that will be around for a long period of time. So those, those provisions that are being considered right now at the federal level for 45Q, we've had tremendous opportunities already with the 50 and $35 per ton, but a lot of our industrial partners have, have made significant uh, just comments that if that number goes even higher, if we can get it up to the $85 per ton that's proposed as well as extending 45Q, and focus specifically on infrastructure investment, which is uh, very evident in the scale lack where, where DOE is going to become a very uh, close investment partner for infrastructure. All of those things very uh, pair very well with turning in this, this into an industry that we can be very proud of. So at the end of the day, what Louisiana is trying to do is to make sure that we're doing these things responsibly. We, we focus very heavily on community engagement. We're looking at all the different parameters on what we need to do to make sure that communities are, are fully uh, they fully understand what these projects look like. I think that there's a lot of information out there and probably a lot of misinformation about what a carbon capture project is. So I think that that involvement and that engagement is absolutely critical. We're going to continue to work with all of our partners to do this and to make sure that this industry grows and that it's done in an environmentally responsible manner. And uh, we're, we're very excited about uh, these projects that have been announced. And I really think that we're going to see a lot more development in the next several years. So uh, what, what I'll leave you with today before we go to uh, quickly with questions is that um, the, the state partnerships and the carbon capture coalition and the regional collaborations, th those things are absolutely critical to moving these things forward. And I think that many times when we work on policies, sometimes it's very easy to get into a, a siloed approach, but the more that states work together to try to, to see the build out of these things happen, the better and the more successful all this industry is going to be. So I, I would encourage you to, to, number one, take a look at what primacy means for your state, whether you can staff it, whether the source material is there, but also to look very closely as to what hap what's happening next door to work with your, your sister states or even the non-contiguous ones, because we've had tremendous success working with the state of Oklahoma and Wyoming and others that, that have really helped us to kind of work through a lot of these big picture issues. So. It's uh, been a pleasure to be with all of you today and uh, look forward to questions. And uh, thanks so much to Kevin for his, his great intro. It made, made my job a whole lot easier. Thank you, Jason. Uh, a few questions for you guys. First of all, what advice do you have for states looking to get, in, uh, to get primacy? I could take the first stab at it. Um, I, think, I think Jason you know, hit it on the head. It's that there's that communication element with EPA um you know what what we've seen is it is a full-time job you know at least to get the application ready and submitted uh then then the workload does does fall off and so with, with north dakota i was you know there was a full-time position as created the uh, legislature the state appropriated uh dollars for that position uh and then and then uh you know that took about two years to negotiate adopt rules in that time typically in, in, I'm guessing other states are similar. It takes about eight to 12 months to adopt administrative rules. Uh, you can't apply for primacy until you have rules on the books that are effective and adopted. Um, and so, so that, that full-time employee or, or maybe multiple staff that can work on it um, to, to get you to where you need to be to apply for primacy. There is a negotiation with EPA. Um, I always talk about the, the primacy process. You can, you can take a few different roads. You can adopt the rules verbatim, which is, which is really easy. You could adopt them, by, adopt them by reference, which is easier, or you could do what North Dakota has done and maybe some other states where we wrote out those rules. Uh, we had to fit them into a, a different type of philosophy, which in North Dakota, it's a resource management philosophy versus a waste disposal philosophy. Uh, and we had that framework already in place. So we had to build in the class six rules to what North Dakota had already developed. Um, and so that takes time if you go that route and it takes staff. Okay, thank you, Kevin. Um, next question, and, and it looks like it'll be our last question. We'll wrap it up after this one. But what challenges have you experienced and what are the potential solutions you can offer to others with those challenges? 
Sure, I'll, I'll hit very quickly on that. I think that the, what, one of the things that we mentioned in, in remarks was just communication. And I think that when you look at community involvement and working through climate, uh, there, there is a lot of information out there. there. There's a lot of information on what CCUS projects look like. And I think that it's imperative for the states to, to work through that with those individual communities and make sure the developers fully recognize that they need to be very engaged with the communities and they need to understand on how all these things fit in. And I think at the end of the day, trying to work through and to make sure that clean energy and looking forward, that, that it's an all hands on deck approach and that you know CCUS directly supports hydrogen, that supports some of these other industries. So I think that you have to try to incorporate working with the community so that they understand that each one of these things has to play a critical role for us to be successful in long-term and reducing emissions. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jason. And thank you, Kevin, as well for this, this wonderful uh, panel. And for, with that, I will kick it back to Kirsten. And um, Kirsten, take it away. Hi, everyone. So we're actually going to go on a break until three o'clock. Um, and when we come back, we're going to have a great panel on community engagement, specifically around workforce development and economic development. So we'll see you all soon.
I will. Hello. How are you, Matt? Good. How are you doing? I don't think we've met before. Yeah, I don't think we have. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you too. So you are um, your professor, is that correct? No, I'm the executive director of the state energy office in Colorado. Okay, got it, right, yes. I was just out in your state um, a month ago, climbing 14ers. Yeah, great, which ones? <laughs> we did uh, Shivano, Tabaquatch, Princeton, um and then a bunch out in uh the san juans we did the wilson group mm -hmm. uh mount snaffles um and uh we did one more which i am escaping me right now but anyway it, it was lovely i especially enjoyed the the san juans just extraordinary yeah they're remarkable they're they really are they're just incredible the closest the U.S. has to the Canadian Rockies. It's very true. It's very true. Yeah. I was actually just out in that area in in August doing the Sneffels Highline Trail there. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, that is a, a great area. I really enjoyed uh, Sneffels. It's just a very accessible um you know, nice hike with the views are extraordinary. It would be someplace where I would take uh, take folks who aren't, you know, climbers or yeah. aren't as comfortable. It was just really beautiful. I'm assuming we're all good to go in two minutes. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yes, hi everybody, sorry, I'm here. Um, it looks like all of you are here. So yes, I will get the next slide queued up. Great. And I have slides from Matt and Sally. Rudra, I know you're not having slides, correct? If you're here. Yes, that's correct. I'm going to give them a wee little break from the slideshow in between. Perfect. Thank you all for closing us out. We're excited for the session. Great. And Kelsey, will you be doing a quick intro before I start? I'll just say we're coming back from the break and then I'll turn it over to you if that's great. okay. That sounds great. Great, thanks. All right, everyone, welcome back to our workshop on carbon capture utilization and storage. I hope you are able to enjoy the quick break. Um, I'm looking forward to our next and final session before we have just a round table for open state discussion. Um, this next session is going to be moderated by Dr. Will Tour, and I'm gonna hand it over to him. Take it away, Will. Great, thank you very much, Kelsey, and great to be here today for this discussion on engaging communities on carbon capture and you know, as our states move forward on carbon capture use and storage policies and projects, you know, it's increasingly clear that it's not just about the technical side of it, uh, but it's also about how are communities going to respond? Will there be the, the available workforce? And how does this play into sort of just transition and economic support for communities that are transitioning away from fossil fuels? And so, this whole question of how can states sort of deal with sort of the workforce and community issues in addition to the infrastructure issues, I think is gonna be very important going forward. Um, you know, from a Colorado perspective, back in 2019, our le legislature adopted greenhouse gas emissions targets for the state of a 50% reduction below 2005 levels by 2030 and a 90% level 
re reduction by 2050. And, you know, there were some things that were pretty obvious. It was very clear that the, the largest near-term emissions reductions would come from the transition in the electric sector as expensive legacy coal plants retire and are replaced by wind and solar. But then there were other areas where it was much less clear what the, what the pathway would be. And as we move forward on developing a state, a green strategic roadmap for uh, reducing greenhouse gas pollution, we heard a lot of input from industry on the importance uh, of taking carbon capture seriously. We started by thinking it was probably primarily a post 2030 uh, play, but heard from more and more players who are working on sort of real project development today. So coming out of that, you know, as a state, we put together a carbon capture task force that has broad representation from industry, academics, regulators, um, community groups and environmental organizations in addition to labor to really start sort of figuring out these issues of both what is the appropriate role of carbon capture in meeting our, our state GHG targets? What role can it play in just transition away from fossil fuels? And how, how do we address the potential concerns that are, that are out there from communities on, on issues like what will the impact of carbon capture be on localized air pollutants as opposed to uh, moving with other strategies? So we're, we're in the, the throes of that process right now and we'll have recommendations to our governor by the end of this year. Um, so I know that there are many states that are grappling with similar issues and very interested in you know, the, the conversation today and really hearing from, from experts in this area. We, we're going to have three speakers, each of whom will um, speak for a few minutes, after which we will go to questions and discussion. Um, our speakers are Matt Bright, the Senior Advocacy Advisor for the Global CCS Institute, Dr. Rudra Kapila, Senior Policy Advisor for Carbon Management at Third Way, and Dr. Sally Greenberg, Principal Scientist at the Illinois State Geological Survey. So Matt, why don't we start with you? Sounds great. Thanks, Will. Um, so just a caveat, Will said that we are experts in this. I am by no means an expert in engaging communities on CCUS workforce development and economic support. Um, I would say that, uh, that my allies, colleagues, and friends, Rudra and uh, Sally, are much more experts in this field. So I, I, I sort of see it as prepping the soil, what I'm going to do here, and then um, I plan to do uh, a lot of listening and learning um, like the rest of you. So I just wanted to throw that out there um, that, uh, that this is something I think we're all learning in together. And, um, and we, you know, as, as think tanks and nonprofits have a lot to learn in this all around. Um, so next slide. Great, so the, I work for the Global CCS Institute and we are an international think tank, a member-led um, think tank headquartered in Melbourne, Australia. Uh, we have offices in Washington, DC, Houston, uh, Brussels, London, the UAE, Beijing, and Tokyo. And um, we are a little bit different in that we have a very, very clear mission, and it is just to accelerate the deployment of carbon capture and storage. It's very, very simple. Um, we want to solve climate change, and we think that carbon capture and storage, as the scientists and uh, the modelers tell us, is going to need to play a central role. Um, and so we think that can be done right, and so that's why we're happy to talk on this panel today, but our membership consists of governments. So we have the Department of Energy, for example, is one of our members. So we have global corporations, um, small companies, NGOs. Uh, and um, as I said, our, our mission is really to accelerate the deployment of CCS. Next slide. Um, I think it's, if you haven't been to, or aren't familiar with the Global CCS Institute, if you haven't been to our website, um, please do check it out, especially the, our core. If you just type in uh, 
global CCS Institute, CO2 RE, CCS facilities, something like that, you're bound to bring up this page because we keep track of the CCS facilities around the world. We've been doing this the longest, and I know Third Way also does as well. Um, so does the Clean Air Task Force. But we've been at it the longest, and um, sort of the grandfather in this, uh, and next slide. So if you just look at the world map of where CCS facilities are located in various stages of development, you can see all the pretty little dots here. Um, there are 66 currently commercial CCS facilities around the globe. Although I will say that that is about to get a major, um, major, major update um, to the tune of um, around doubling that number for what we're counting it. Um, and we will be launching that, inform that new revamp of our map coming up here in our core database on October 12th with our global status report launch. So I'd highly recommend that you attend our global status report launch where we cover essentially everything that's going on in the carbon capture and storage landscape around the world. So we'll cover North America, we'll cover Europe, we'll cover Asia Pacific. Um, and, and it'll be very, very interesting just to hear what's going on. And, and we're also going to be putting a lot more dots on the map. Um, so that's exciting, but for the moment, uh, 66, as I said, a little bit, not quite, it, it's a lot more than that, but we'll just say 66 for the moment until we go public. Next slide. Um, of these 66 commercial CCS facilities, 26 are operating. And by that, we mean they're currently capturing CO2 and storing it underground. Um, some of them are sending their um, carbon dioxide to enhanced oil recovery fields. But again, remember that at the end of the enhanced oil recovery process, carbon dioxide does go in the ground and you screw the top on to a well and carbon dioxide stays there. So there are four facilities under construction, uh, 34 under development and uh, two with operations suspended. Um, one of those I think we know well is Petronova. Um, and then 12, 12 of these operating, in other words, currently capturing CO2 uh, facilities are operating in the US. So next slide. And last year, uh, there were 40 million tons of CO2 captured and stored around the globe. So those 26 operating facilities are putting that much CO2 under the ground uh, permanently. Next slide. Um, and to date, 300 million tons of carbon dioxide have been stored safely. And that's important to note, I think, especially for a lot of states who are really the trailblazers, you're going to be the ones who uh, are implementing CCS, implementing the rules and the regulations. And I think it's really important that the general public understand that carbon capture is working. It's working right now and it has worked in the past. So it's not, yes, it is a nascent technology, but it's not, uh, it wasn't just born yesterday. And we have captured. Uh, 300 million tons of CO2 to date and stored it safely. Next slide. So I mentioned there are 12 operating CCS projects in the US. This is a table with the projects and where they're located. Uh, in eight states, you can see that Texas and Kansas uh, certainly have a handful. Um, really the Midwest and uh, mountain states, Wyoming, um, that we're talking about. And interestingly enough, if you look at the CCS application in the third column, so that is what the CCS equipment, what type of facility is playing host to the CCS equipment, uh, it's all industrial. So hydrogen production, ethanol, a lot of ethanol, fertilizer, uh, nitrogen producing facilities, natural gas processing is another huge one. Um, so that's in some ways the low hanging fruit for CCS. Um, and unfortunately or fortunately, um, 
a lot of uh, folks, when we're thinking about decarbonization, you know, that doesn't, that's not the first thing that comes to mind are these types of facilities. And yet they're very important, of course, for making the world the way it is today for all of us. So again, I think that's a message that needs to come out that our economy is very, very complicated. And there are a lot of facilities that people might drive by every day and they have no idea that uh, they're capturing carbon dioxide there. Um, and also, what does this facility produce? And why is it important to my life? Next slide. So what does the science say about CCS? Um, it, it's pretty unequivocal. The IPCC says that the overall abatement cost of reaching net zero emissions by 2050 is more than double, i.e. 138% more expensive if it's done without using CCS. Um, you know, the IPC said carbon capture is especially important as a tool to decarbonize heavy industries. Uh, the International Energy Agency got more explicit. They said it's nearly impossible to decarbonize heavy industries, especially cement production without CCS. Um, they also say we need a hundred volt scale, scale up. And, you know, the National Academy of Sciences has done a, quite a bit of work on direct air capture, that side of carbon capture. And they say that we can safely store more carbon dioxide than we can capture in the next 80 years. So it's pretty unequivocal that, that states have to, we need to adopt more CCS. That's just the future and a future with a reality of climate crisis just knocking on our door right here, actually in our living room is, is more like it. Um, so next slide. Um, so here's the energy world as we know it. If you were to ask a lot of people, um, what's an image of energy? This would probably be what would come to mind and why. It's because when you're driving along uh, in your states, most everybody's seen one of these, right? They've seen a pump jack. They've seen a wind turbine. They've seen a solar panel at this point, a field of solar panels. They've seen smokestacks. It's familiar. And next slide. They've also seen this too. You know, you go to the gas, uh, you go to the pump, right? And you see that little sign contains 10% ethanol. You turn on your stove and, and out comes uh, methane, which you're then gonna burn. Um, Tesla, you know, uh, electric vehicle charging stations. This is, this is the energy world as we know it. Um, and next slide, what about the energy world that's unknown out there? And that's really this, right? carbon dioxide, transport, storage, capture. It's just a world that people don't know about. And so next slide, um, what I would really posit is the major hurdle for CCS deployment among states and in this country, is people just have never heard of it or seen it. They're, they're, it's unfamiliar. And of course, something that's unfamiliar is strange and scary, and um, people aren't just aware of it. And when we talk about the climate crisis, we don't unpack that word crisis, that uh, the part of the crisis is that it, we have a huge big economy that makes our world. And every time you put on a nylon jacket, uh, you know, that did come from, from oil, um, that it, it's people, it's just hard to grasp that how much the crisis is also a crisis of, um, we have a very complicated world and we need to decarbonize every facet of it. And that's going to be hard. And carbon capture needs to become like uh, the, the energy world as we know it today. So next slide. So just, uh, just another quick you know, visual. Here's our natural gas pipelines in the US in blue. We have a ton of them. Next slide. Uh, here's our carbon dioxide pipelines in the US, um, you know, and then next slide. So CO2 pipelines, natural gas pipelines um, right next to each other. That doesn't seem to be showing. Yep, right there. So um, we're going to need to, um, you know, change, change the shape of the, the US a little bit to, to really deploy CCS wide scale. Next slide. Just the final example that I want to give is, um, is 
this, that, um, you know, po policy can work. The renewable fuel standard certainly um, made a massive increase in ethanol, right? And it got us that 10%. And so I'm not prescribing anything, but I would just say um, that policy can really drive the adoption of energy technologies. So that's all I have. Um, you're welcome to reach out to me on uh, email and uh, happy to chat more, happy to be on this panel. Thank you very much, Matt. Uh, Dr. Kapila, let's go to you. Hi there. Um, good afternoon, everyone, and uh, delighted to be here and join my esteemed panel. So thank you very much, Tanisio, for inviting me. Um, so Matt just talked about carbon capture and storage, which is capturing CO2 from point sources. Uh, what I'm going to talk about is he briefly mentioned something called direct air capture or DAC, which is really capturing the carbon dioxide in the ambient air. And um, just briefly about my background, um, so my name is Dr. Kapila and I am the senior policy advisor for carbon management at Third Way, which is a wee little think tank based in Washington, DC. But we, um, we work on domestic and statewide policies. And when I say carbon management, I'm working on uh, things within my portfolio that include um, carbon capture and storage, uh, direct air capture, uh, and also hydrogen. So um, just to kind of bring it into a bit of a hot topic um, to tie everything I'll talk to you about this afternoon briefly into a hot topic, um, the 1.2 trillion uh, bipartisan infrastructure bill that is, will they, won't they, um, you know, pass it today or this week or in the coming weeks. Um, Within that bill uh, is something very interesting. Uh, there are there is a core element which um, includes provisions for CO two transport, storage, infrastructure, um, fund a lot of funding for CCS demonstrations and projects, and and feed studies. But there's also something um, about an, a brand new program which creates hubs for DAC, direct air capture machines. And the interesting thing about DAC is that they can be paired with or share infrastructure with other types of point source carbon capture, so CCS. Um, and it could be combined with natural gas, steel, cement. Uh, so it also has industrial applications. And um, you know, the use of DAC is essentially to bring down the residual emissions as well, the emissions that we get from processes at various industrial facilities uh, to really kind of bring down any residual emissions that would be in a concentrated industrial area, as well as there's a lot of flexibility with DAC, you know, it could be paired with natural carbon removal systems. So um, that's kind of one of the beauties about direct air capture um, is its flexibility. However, there is a distinct gap in knowledge, um, particularly around it, surrounding the um, environmental impacts on air quality, both indirectly and directly with DAC systems. Um, and that's because few projects actually exist. Uh, we have one under construction in Texas, um, it's the big carbon engineering, one megaton scale of um, uh, CO2 capture uh, uh, sitting on top of the Permian Basin. So, you know, that's something that's coming online, but given that there's very little public information on air quality, makes it slightly, makes it difficult to inform educate and empower communities. And when we're talking about some of the challenges about deploying these technologies at such a large scale within uh, various communities, we have to look at their priorities. So what are the, you know, the universal priorities amongst communities living either in close proximity to these technologies 
or having to deal with them is air quality, water quality, impacts to human health and safety, land use, energy needs, and ecological integrity. So when we are deploying such projects, we really need to think about the research and the policy design that would go into community education on this particular topic. And that area is still, it's a nascent area. Um, again, like I said, you know, there aren't that many large projects for direct air capture. And to be honest, also, even though there are CCS projects in existence, really kind of deployment at scale of this full chain of the capture, the transport by a pipeline or shipping or, or um, other modes of transport, and then the actual final storage or utilization. I mean, that's another element about this um, technological system. But I must say, because I did mention the infrastructure bill, the US does have the most developed policy landscape and capacity to deploy and regulate um, these technologies. And, um, you know, uh, there's a 3.5 billion program set aside in this infrastructure bill for these DAC hubs. So, um, and, and, you know, what would be interesting about these DAC hubs is that they would be co-located with other industrial or power or CCS projects. And um, it's quite likely that that might be the configuration of some of the earlier stages of developing direct air capture. And it's advantageous because they would share infrastructure as well as industrial workforces. And that leads me to, I would say almost the kind of wee little split amongst environmental groups and environmental justice groups when it comes to these technologies. Um, I think one group uh, is in strong support given the jobs that are associated with these technologies. We, uh, third way, we, uh, we did a bit of work on um, supply chains associated with the build out of these uh, technological systems. So there definitely is a direct transfer of skills from you know, um, more mature energy sectors directly into these new industries. Uh, and so there are communities who are actually really looking forward to having these kind of technologies in place for the job creation um, and the associated expansion of manufacturing and industries that would go with this. Uh, but then on the other side, we also have communities that oppose these technologies um, because, you know, sometimes they're considered false solutions because they're designed to extend the life of polluting industries. So that term greenwashing is also associated with some of these technologies. Um, I have to say there is, there is both a perceived and a real risk that, you know, um, direct air capture projects and some CCS projects could exacerbate the status quo um, and the continued impact on communities of color in particular who live near a lot of the fossil fuel and industrial clusters in the US. Um, so given there is this long legacy of race being a determining factor of whether someone lives near a, a polluting facility, you know, that has been a deliberate outcome of local state and federal land use policy. So this is where we have these two, um, two groups, I could say, in terms, uh, sorry, two perspectives, I could say, in terms of those that are quite in support of such deployment of technologies and the opposition. Um, I think for now I'll leave it at that uh, and I'm happy to you know answer questions and kind of elaborate further on this but quite happy to pass on to my colleague um, Dr Sally Greenberg who can talk a bit more about community engagement.
Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Capella. Dr. Greenberg? Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here this afternoon and to be the, the last speaker in a, a long um, line of, of um, August speakers that you've heard over the last couple of days. You know, I, I, um, I used to really um, worry that stakeholder engagement and um, community uh, conversations were the last thing on the agenda when it comes to us talking about carbon capture and storage. And what I've really come to realize lately is there's a reason for that, and that is because communities and engagement uh, really encompass all of the other puzzle pieces that have to come together when we think about carbon capture utilization and storage. And so um, I show this, this diagram just to say that over the past 20 years, I really do think that the pieces have come together. And you, one of the ways that you can see that is by the progression of the language that we use. We used to talk about technical and non-technical barriers, and then they became obstacles and challenges and finally successes. And now we talk about what does it mean to have commercial deployment and how do we um, and how how do we go down that path? Next slide, please. And the previous picture was quite simple, but as anybody uh, engaged in this space will tell you, uh, the reality is much, much more complex and the pieces um, as we get further down this road uh, become more refined and more complicated. And I think that uh, Dr. Capilla's comments uh, just a, a moment ago about environmental justice and, and how that fits into the thinking and deployment around uh, carbon capture utilization and storage, especially at the state level, is very, very a very salient point in this. Next slide, please. Um, I like to think about stakeholder engagement. This figure is from the National Petroleum Study that was uh, finished in 2019. Uh, in, in three different spheres, there are probably many more ways that you could break this down. But what has been done for the most part until now is really operating with communities and engagement at the project level. We have many examples of successful projects in the United States. I um, led one of those projects and, and my team at the Illinois State Geological Survey uh, is involved in many others as are many of the, the speakers that you've heard from today. Um, and I think um, there's also a relatively fair amount that has happened at the federal policy level and, and you all on this call at, um, are, are thinking about what happens at, this, at the state policy level, but also really where we need to be doing more work is in this public sphere. And I think that's why I'm so excited to be on this panel because I think you are asking that question of, of, how, of how we do that. So next slide, please. One of the things that I wanna highlight is that there are multiple ways in which communities are engaged. There are very, very formal processes, such as the processes that are associated with uh, the permit, the class six permitting process or other permitting processes where people have limited, they have opportunity to make comments, but it's very formalized only at certain times and in only in certain ways. Next slide, please. Um, but really what needs to be happening is there needs to be a lot more informal engagement that happens that um, allows two-way exchange of information, that allows trust to be built and engages um, communities, leaders, regulators, and all stakeholders in a conversation about what carbon capture utilization and storage means. Next slide, please. And some of um, uh, what I'd like to share with you today comes from my own project experience when it comes to engagement. And um, there are certainly, again, many lenses you can use to, to look at this, but um, from, from our own experience here in Illinois, it's critical to start engagement early. For example, to do that informal engagement long before you get to the permitting stage or some sort of formal process. By then, probably you've already missed your opportunity to to build relationships and build trust. It's important to involve leaders, citizens, and regulators um, to proactively listen and respect 
the difference of opinions and the tensions that exist between those differences, as Dr. Capilla just pointed out. I think it's also important to avoid surprises, especially in communities and with community leaders. How you present information and what your messaging is really is important. Um, I've said this a couple of times now, building relationships and having the opportunity to have two-way conversations and, um, and to build trust is, uh, is incredibly, uh, can, cannot be understated, the importance. And then also important uh, to be on track um, and, and monitoring when there's misinformation and, 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 and um, myths that are perpetuated. And Jason Lankaw talked a little bit about this in his remarks. Next slide, please. Um, so uh, what I think, uh, in terms of what is important at the state level moving forward is where we have seen the most success for states that are interested in carbon capture utilization and storage within their state is alignment of the regulatory uh, community, the, your, your Department of Natural Resources, uh, your government's office to have, have a, a state approach. And this is something I think that Kevin Connors uh, outlined in, in one of the ways in which, in some of the ways in which uh, North Dakota has, has um, moved forward. I think it's important to involve your economic development and jobs creation departments, uh, but also in what you do, you want to be looking at ensuring that you have environmental and social justice considerations at the forefront of, of your conversations. I think you want to create robust stakeholder processes that ask and answer hard questions. Um, we, I believe very strongly in providing scientifically based uh, answers to those questions. Um, I also think it's important to engage, and this, this speaks to that alignment piece uh, as my first point here, in holistic planning and, dev and devote the appropriate resources to support your state vision. So for example, if you are a state that is looking at state primacy, um, then how does that get supported through your governmental systems and, and uh, regulatory system uh, throughout the state? And then um, as many of uh, the previous speakers in today's sessions have talked about, State primacy certainly is one of the mechanisms that will um, provide the fastest path to development for um, uh, incorporation of CCUS um, in, your, uh, in your state. And then uh, th the next slide, please, which is my last slide. This is just some excellent resources that are available um, on community engagement some from um, the National Standards um, Organization, uh, ISO and, and ANSI, uh, the World Resources Institute, which did a, a full-blown community engagement scoping um, set of guidelines uh, back uh, about 10 years ago, but it's very salient. And then finally, the best practices for outreach from a project perspective, but also useful, I think, in, in general from the Regional Carbon Sequestration Partnership Program, which was, has been funded by the U.S. Department of Energy for the last 20 years. And with that, I thank you very much, and I'll conclude my remarks. Thank you very much, Dr. Greenberg, and thanks to all the speakers for some really fascinating information there. You know, a couple, couple of you talked about the importance of ensuring that we're sort of leading with environmental justice and understanding environmental justice considerations. But in practice, what, what does that translate into? What should states be doing to ensure that environmental justice issues are given the appropriate consideration when developing these projects? Whoever wants to start. I'll start, Rudra, how's that? And then- Yeah, go for it. <laughs> so I think from a very practical perspective, you need to be having meetings. You need to know who the environmental justice organizations are in the state, involve them in the conversation about um, that state alignment and what the particular localized um, challenges are. Um, I, I really think it's about opening an honest and, and transparent conversation and doing it a lot. And I just want to add to that, looking at the history of 
the EJ environmental justice movement in the US, um, what crops up time and time again is the fact that many projects, um, you know, they interact with communities or community elders at the litigation stage. That is the first time that they have crossed paths. And we can't do that at all with these technologies. Um, and especially as they're being developed at such a large scale, this needs to be an embedded practice from the get go, from the very, very beginning. Uh, I, I should also point out that who influences and shapes the policy and projects and how they do it is also very critically important to some of the core concerns of these EJ groups. Um, and so I think it's also very important to show and also make use of local talent and local knowledge in how you develop these projects. I don't have time for Matt to add. I, I just wanted to add an evangelical amen. That's uh, very well said, nothing to add. So what, one of the things that I certainly see here in Colorado and I suspect is uh, the case all over is sort of real differences in how people think about this depending upon the complexion of their community. So we have a number of areas with heavy industrial facilities, largely in sort of urbanized areas of the state with many sort of low income and minority populations around them where there's sort of really big concerns about sort of the air quality and water quality issues. And I think concerns about whether CCS will extend the lifetime of industrial facilities that some of the folks don't want in their communities. Then we've got rural commu communities that are, you know, have perhaps historic oil and gas development or this historic um, dependence on coal who are really focused on the, the job development and the, the potential for you know, taking the skills that workers have in jobs that may be going away. How do you, as a state, sort of navigate sort of the very different perspectives that we, we may have in a number of areas of a state that all may be places that technically make sense for CCS around existing industry? So, Will, I think one of the things that's important, and this, this, um, this gets at the refinement that I was talking about in my remarks, is that one of the things that we have not really done a lot of to date and needs to be um, done more, and, um, and this is certainly some, something that I think uh, is a, a, a huge contribution to engagement by the states, is we haven't really looked at the differences across the value chain for CCUS of, of what that means for different stakeholders. So, um, you know, for example, and you pointed this out with a slightly different um, uh, perspective, but we have found that oil and gas communities typically have a robust understanding of the subsurface because there's been oil and gas production associated with those. So their understanding of the concepts around carbon storage are, is a relatively easy informational bridge uh, to take. Whereas when you look at uh, urban communities, that is not something that really um, connects with their uh, direct experience. What does connect with direct experience in urban communities is the industrial complexes and the um, infrastructure and issues that go along with that. What isn't necessarily being talked about right now, I think, is that in some ways, the removal of carbon dioxide from those urban environments is improving the, um, the, the climate impacts for those communities. But what we really have to understand and, and nuance and discuss in the environmental justice and jobs context, and, and they may, those things may be in conflict with each other, is, um, is, is where is the 
where is the benefit and how do we equalize the benefit across that value chain? I, I, I will, um, I've, I've taken enough time from my colleagues, so. Any other comments on this question? I think there's just um, briefly like a very kind of universal um, thread or question, whether you're doing CCS domestically at the state level or whether you're deploying it internationally. Um, the communities are always going to ask, how does this project benefit me? And I think education, community education is a very, very important role um, that states should look at in terms of deploying these projects, because if they don't know, you can't sell this to them just by saying, oh, well, it helps decrease the CO2 emissions for the entire world. And they're going to say, well, that's great, but how does that help me? And so I think really kind of educating and also researching, because like, as, as I mentioned in the beginning, there is that knowledge gap on what are the local pollution impacts. And, and when you have that knowledge, um, it's, it's easier to empower communities. But right now we do have a gap in that knowledge and therefore it's difficult to inform and educate communities. But that's, I think, a key part, which I think states could really lead on. Thank you. Matt, do you have any advice from sort of the international experience with community engagement around CCUS? I, I think the biggest, uh... Examples would be, well, the Boundary Dam facility in um, Canada, um, which has been a success, um, so it's going today, you know, that created 1,700 jobs um, to build it. And, and I would just add that, um, you know, I, I think the messaging a lot of times, that economic as well as the, the environmental um, and climate benefits are, if, you know, if you told me, okay, there's a job out there that might pay you 80,000 a year um, oh, and you're going to be saving the world at the same time. How would you like that? I would say, you know, give me the contract, I'll sign. Um, and so I, I think that, um, you know, the jobs aspect is really, really important. And I think Boundary Dam has highlighted that quite a bit, that this is very, uh, very fortuitous for, um, for that region of Canada. I think also, too, um, examples to take in Europe, you know, they're often far more collaborative there. They're far more planning rather than reactionary. And so, um, and also far more, you know, in that hub and cluster network model. And so in many ways, it's much easier um, because they do a lot more of this stakeholder, you know, understanding that people are accepting of it before they just develop something. And that Hub, as, as Rudra mentioned, you know, we're just about to, well, hopefully, fingers crossed, get, you know, money for DAC hubs and, and other hydrogen and that sort of thing, so. I, I just wanted to add, if I may, very quickly on that, is just that I'm actually a product, that's my background, is the public perception work that I did in Scotland. Um, granted, it, and I, uh, you know, that's where my training and everything comes from, and we did do public perception work on offshore CO2 storage. And what we found was that actually people were quite amenable, especially when you talk about how offshore oil and gas jobs are essentially on the decline in Scotland. But if those jobs could be transfer transferred to this new industry, then there's this um, perception that actually it isn't a loss to the community. And on top of that, we are doing something good for the environment. So Maybe a, a quick follow up on that around the workforce opportunities. So to what extent are the skills that today's fossil fuel workers have directly transferable to carbon capture? Is this really a route for folks whose jobs may be going away due to the energy transition to sort of seamlessly move into similar employment? I think it depends on where you look and which, which part of the job sector you look at. Certainly when you think about geoscientists and engineers and operators, 100%. 
Um, but there's there is not necessarily equitable movement in terms of what we think of as clean energy jobs across the board. So um, giving up uh, oil and gas jobs um, may not be as um, economically beneficial to the to an individual as you know compared to installing solar equipment or something like that. So there's 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 a lot of nuance, but there's there's also a lot of carryover in certain industries and in certain places. I was going to say there is like work being done um, that's yet to be published, but we're at Third Way looked at DAC supply chains. And there's definitely um, a direct transfer of um, skill sets in the construction um, sectors. Uh, so certainly for the next decade or so, as these are built out, there will be a transfer of skills directly from various construction sectors in the oil and gas sector to these newer technologies. And in Scotland, certainly there's a direct transfer of skills from those offshore workers who would then be um, you know, working offshore or, on, or managing offshore uh, CO2 injection sites. Thank you. I know that we are running out of time. So I have one, one final question, which is just any advice that each of the three of you would have for states as they move forward on you know, developing their carbon capture frameworks? Sally, you wanna lead? Sure, I mean, I think that um, heeding the advice that has come from just about every speaker today, I, I, and I assume yesterday is really um, what, you, what you want to do. I think um, even, even though there's, a, I would say a difference in perception about this, there's a significant amount of resource in the United States through the regional carbon sequestration partnerships and initiatives and some of the, the state, um, the other state-based organizations that uh, we heard about from the Carbon Capture Coalition. There's a lot of resources and people out there that you can bring in to, to, to contribute to the conversation that, that can help you um, uh, uh, should you desire that. And, and then I'll echo something that I heard Kevin Connor say, um, and that is, look to your neighbors and see what they're doing and, and they, how, how they can help. But certainly any of the people on this panel and many of the other experts that um, have been doing uh, carbon capture and storage in the United States for the last 20 years can help at the state level. Yeah. Go I'm for it. Go. I just, I think um, everything that has been said is, very useful, but I would also like to add that um, building a very diverse and uh, inclusive clean and technology uh, clean technology industry is also quite key when you're engaging with communities. If they can see people like themselves, if they can picture themselves working in these industries, um, that will also be very crucial for the deployment. And again, something for states to consider. Thanks. I would just add really quickly that uh, not to be afraid of CCS, um, to, to get, you know, get the knowledge out there. And um, again, you know, wind turbines, uh, solar panels, we've seen these. We see these as we're driving down the road every day. And, um, and I think carbon capture is sort of a hidden but really potent thing and, and that knowledge not, not to be afraid of it and the infrastructure and the ecosystem that surrounds it. Thank you very much. And thanks to all of our speakers for a great panel. I'd like to turn it over to Kirsten now for the next session.
Great, thank you so much. Thank you, Matt, Sally, and Woodra. This was great. And thank you so much, Will, for um, moderating this panel. Yes, so we have our last panel, which actually is really um, designed to have you all engage um, with each other. So my colleague will um, promote you all to panelists, which means just that you can freely unmute yourself and, and speak. Um, so just a heads up that we're going to kind of bring you all into the panelist fold. But what we're really hoping to do with this um, time is to hear from you, to hear what kind of information um, you're taking away from these past two days, what kind of information you still need, um, what kind of outstanding questions are and where maybe the Department of Energy or NASIO or other organizations can really help you, the states, or other participants today um, to move forward with some of these um, CCUS projects and policies. Um, so you can also, if you have a, a thought, put that in the chat or you can um, also raise your hand and we can just unmute you um, and invite you to speak as well. Um, so hopefully there's some thoughts. I'm also happy to call on people. I've been known to do that. Um, so I know there are a couple of people um, that have participated and have um, kind of raised some of the questions. So I'm just going to start calling maybe on Sumesh because there was a question, Sumesh, that you put in the chat today um, about the primacy question and kind of how states can um, be supported as they're looking into primacy. And so I'm wondering what, from your state's perspective, maybe if you wanna share how that would be helpful or if there are other states um, on the line, like what exactly would be helpful for NASI or DOE to provide information on and, and maybe in what format? And I invite to, have anybody else jump in too. This doesn't have to be only the people who, who are called on. So if there's anything that you wanna share, you can also share what maybe is happening in your, your states currently um, as you're thinking about CCUS, what kind of policy challenges, regulatory barriers you're seeing, what kind of promising um, things are happening in your states. And feel free to put that in the chat as well, or unmute yourself or raise your hand. And also maybe if, if any states are working with your neighbors um, or you know, are doing regional initiatives. And I don't know, Ed, we've heard from, from um, Louisiana, but maybe you want to share a little bit more kind of where you see, like maybe some lessons learned on the primacy that we haven't covered today yet. Um, I think Jason covered a lot of what, uh, what, can be said for Louisiana, um, but thank you for putting me on the spot there. I appreciate that. Uh, well, you, he mentioned that you guys were working a lot with other states. Could you maybe uh, elaborate a little bit about how it came about and what um, what sort of prompted that to like branch out and, and work not just with neighboring states, but other states on this issue? Well, I think when Jason was tasked with this, J Jason is far more involved in all of this than I am. But um, when Jason was tasked with this, um, he thought that was the best way to gain knowledge about CCUS in general and see what other states are doing. Um, we didn't want to necessarily be looked at as uh, going in the, into it with no knowledge whatsoever. So definitely working with other states gives you the knowledge and gives your state the knowledge. And, you know, 
the other aspect about working with other states is you can have someone to talk to about this. Okay, what issues did you encounter when that happened? Um, what are some other factors that um, go into it that we need to be aware of? You know, what kind of pushback did you, did you get any pushback? What kind of pushback did you get? Who did you get pushback from? How did you overcome it? So I think the best thing about working with states is is going over some of the problems that they've encountered so you could mitigate them before they become problems with what you're proposing. Uh, th this is Rodney. Maybe I can uh, ask Edward to expand a little to put him even more on the spot. Um, you, you, you're sort of naturally, you and your neighbor, Texas at least, are sort of naturally a hub because of the strong concentration of federal chemical industry and, mm -hmm. and related industries. Mm -hmm. There's already a network of uh, pipelines for petrochemical as well as uh, hydrogen, actually. Mm -hmm. So there seems to be a good confluence of opportunity for CCUS as well as a hydrogen economy and, and doing this transition. So beyond learning lessons from, from other states, are, is there, are there opportunities for cooperation? So uh, the, the firms and, and the industries in, in both your states can, can share infrastructure and, and expertise and, and so forth? Um, expertise, definitely. Infrastructure, since certain pipelines are both intra and interstate, um, it becomes a little bit more difficult in that sense. Um, but I, I think definitely the expertise with uh, the various, uh, uh, Texas in particular, but the various states that neighbor us um, is, is irreplaceable, to tell you the truth. You know, we, we lean on Texas and some of their expertise for, for this, but we they also lean on us for certain aspects of this. Um, the other thing is that when you look at the business aspect of things, you know, we have a lot of the business hubs based out of Houston that are involved in CCUS, but you, we're doing a lot with CCUS in order to utilize some of the, the old, um, the used wells, let's say. Um, and, and not just that, they're, I believe they're, I, I believe they're going into uh, the salt domes here. Don't quote me on that. Um, like I said, this is more Jason's uh, expertise than mine. I'm more on the oil and gas side of things still, um, but, but I'm learning quickly. Um, it, it, but uh, it's a, uh, Dealing with the multinational corporations that are involved with CCUS, it's definitely, it, I know Jason goes back and forth to Houston to talk about, um, or prior to the pandemic, he was going back and forth to Houston to talk about them, and now it's mostly Zoom, but um, he, he's doing a great job getting uh, corporations involved with uh, CCUS within Louisiana. Great. Please no, more, please no more spots. No more spots. I'm going to call on other people because I have some volunteers. So I know Shelly um, has kindly volunteered to talk a little bit about what's happening in Iowa. There's a task force that was just set up, and then after Shelly, I'm going to call on David, who's also volunteered to talk. So just a heads up, <laughs> Shelly, what's going on in Iowa? We'd love to hear more. Okay, hi, Kirsten. Um, so we are about halfway through a governor's led uh, carbon sequestration task force. Uh, she gave us a hundred day timeline. Um, so we are moving very, very quickly here uh, with the intent to just get a list of uh, carbon related policy issues and actions uh, to consider. Um, to do that, we've put together a task force of about 22 uh, representatives from industry, biofuels, um, government agencies, utilities, and agriculture. Um, so support and supporting that high level task force are an energy work group and an agriculture work group 
each of which has um, around 15 um, members. And so, as I mentioned, we're about halfway through it, um, you know, generating ideas, beginning to weigh the pros and cons. Um, of course, there's, you know, already a pretty well-defined opportunity for carbon capture at our biofuels plants um, with transport um, either north or east of Iowa. Uh, for storage, we do not have geological formations here uh, to accommodate that. Um, you know, so that's part of the discussion. Um, but you know, we've also got so much of, of that um, those egg commodities that come from here, whether it's livestock or row crops, and there's a lot of carbon opportunities there uh, that are being discussed as well. And then on the back end, we've got the food processing. Um, so it, it's a pretty holistic look. And um, we'll be having our findings uh, probably in December to share with everybody. Great. That was, that'd was that be great. Yeah. And what after the finding in December, um, can you maybe talk a little bit of what sort of the outlook is and if there's anything like you need from, from either sort of the federal level or from, from us on information or support? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, all of the above, you know, we, we'll still be in the information gathering stages. Um, we are looking to other states, uh, what other states are doing. Um, and of course that storage piece will definitely require other states uh, since we have to transport that that carbon um, out of Iowa, um, but uh, you, you know, continued collaboration with our neighboring states, um, trying to align with with whatever federal policies are are coming, and can further encourage uh, what what we'll prioritize here. Great. Yeah, and please do not hesitate to reach out if there's anything we can do or any information we can provide. Um, we certainly are going to continue to engage with um, FECM on CCUS in the States. So happy to support. So thank you for that update, Shelley. We appreciate it. And maybe in December, when you have your findings, we can invite you, you back to share that with us. Yeah, definitely. Great. Um, David, I think you had a, a couple of um, items you wanted to raise. So I'll call it on you next. Uh, yes, uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Oh, okay, great. Uh, no, I appreciate uh, you allowing me to do this, but I look at it, I'm a petroleum engineer, I've been a reservoir engineer for a really long time. And, you know, the transition to me uh, really is, is uh, for, uh, carbon capture side of it is really is from fossil fuels to hydrogen. And and that to me, that that's going to be the driving force in Houston. And, and the link that I, the reason I sent the, I sent a link up on the posting is, is really is to get information out. Education is, is the name of the game. And, and uh, your previous uh, uh, people that have been out there have been talking you know, a lot about that. So I just wanted to uh, inform the communities that the Houston CCUS hub is, uh, is started. And uh, to me, the, the driving force in the future is really driving toward hydrogen. It's not just, you know, we need electric cars and all this other kind of stuff. But when you look at the benefits of uh, hydrogen, it's not any different than what it was in the early 1900 to 1905 when New York City had all electric cars. And then three, three years later, it all went to gasoline. So, but uh, to me, there has to be a transition period and uh, it has to be equal uh, and, uh, not overly regulated. So I'll end with that comment. Great, thank you. Yeah, and we shared that link in, in the chat. Um, would you want to like talk a little bit more about where you see maybe the role of the state energy offices in making that transition? Well, yes, and I, this gets back to my my uh, uh, link in it's a LinkedIn article that I sent out, but it's a really cul culmination of three or four of them. It deals with uh, Exxon Mobil with a $100 billion uh, effort to, for carbon capture and storage. And then you tie that in with Denbury, which is the pipeline system already in place, already sequestering CO2 or, or putting CO2 in, in enhanced oil recovery projects. 
And then the third part of that deals with Talus Energy, <clears throat> which gained right, first rights for CO2 storage in deep saline aquifers offshore. And I say offshore, it's offshore Texas waters. It's not offshore federal, but it's not onshore where you end up with you know, storage issues in regards to who owns the storage rights. So it's really Texas waters and the Bureau of Economic Geology is it, tied behind this, um, ExxonMobil, Talos, all these different companies. Great, well, thank you for that perspective. I guess I'll give uh, one last call for people to join and just uh, speak a little bit about what's happening in their state or any kind of issues they wanna raise or requests they have for, for Nazio or DOE, feel free to put it in the chat or raise your hand or unmute yourself. Um, as I mentioned before, Nazio is certainly going to continue this work in, in this area. Um, I mentioned already the excellent paper that Rodney wrote on CCUS, but we will actually also next month release a companion paper on hydrogen, um, also written by Rodney. Um, and so hopefully you all take some, some um, information from that, that is specifically on, on hydrogen technologies, but also again, looking very much towards what state energy offices um, should or could consider um, going forward as we move on, on hydrogen. And I should also mention that um, NASIO is part of the Western Green Hydrogen Initiative, um, which is a, a kind of a consortium of NASIO, WEEB, together with the Green Hydrogen Initiative. And, um, looking at how kind of uh, in the West, some of the states could potentially develop some roadmaps. There is 11 states and two Canadian provinces that are members of the Western Green Hydrogen Initiative. Um, and uh, some observer states um, have also joined um, just really looking at what kind of considerations um, are there for hydrogen. Uh, British Columbia, for example, has released a uh, roadmap that they don't want to call a roadmap, so maybe I'll call it a strategy paper um, on what hydrogen possibilities are, are there for, for that province. So I invite you to check back the NASIO resources webpage that my co colleague Kelsey has put in the chat um, for the hydrogen paper. So I don't see anybody else who wants to chime in. I'm not going to make you all, so I'm going to turn it over to Kelsey to, to close, that out, close us out and uh, give us a few minutes back of our time. But again, um, thank you to um, the uh, Office of Fossil Energy and uh, Carbon Management for their support and my excellent colleagues, uh, Rodney, Kelsey and Shamika for pulling this all together and to all of our speakers and moderators yesterday and today for their excellent contributions. Kelsey? Yeah, thanks, Kirsten. So we've come to the end of our workshop on CCUS. Um, thank you again, as Kirsten mentioned, all our excellent speakers and moderators. Um, we covered a lot of material ranging from CO2 conversion to 45Q tax credits and even talked about the infrastructure bill, which obviously we still have fingers crossed that we'll hear something today, but otherwise, hopefully soon. Um, so it definitely looks like states are all in various stages around CCUS and that the conversation is just getting started. So please utilize the resources we shared over the last two days and hopefully you've made some valuable connections that you can check on, check in with and um, get some advice and lean on each other going forward. Um, so be on the lookout for a summary document and recordings of the workshop. And thank you again, please reach out with any questions. Have a great day.